Okay. Then uh, why don't we kick this off at 7.02 and we'll kick off the meeting. Riley, would you like to uh, go ahead and put up the agenda for everyone to take a look at? And then while Riley's putting up the agenda, um, a few items that I do want to talk through. And one is um, we're gonna move our voting style to voting by roll call and Riley's going to help me facilitate that. And then the, the second item is we have another packed agenda for tonight. And so there, uh, I know people have come to talk about some pretty serious issues that we have on the agenda and we really appreciate people uh, dialing in as well as the dialogue um, those in the community have had over the last month. Um, it's very helpful for us. And so, um, but we will be limiting uh, conversation times on these as we work through the agenda so that we can stay on schedule and make sure those that um, do want to speak can speak. So um, for those who um, do wanna participate in any of the community engagement sections of the official actions, what I'd ask is for you to prepare your thoughts now and limit those thoughts to two minutes. And so that means getting organized right now with what your pertinent items are that you'd like to discuss. And with that, um, we will kick this off with um, any updates needed to our agenda for tonight. Okay, with no updates, um, we'll, we'll move to uh, approving the agenda for tonight. And Riley, would you like to take Role of this, we'll just get started as using this as our sample. Okay. Um, so, do we have everyone here? Three D O one, vote in favor of the agenda. Yes. Three D O two. Yes. Three D O three. I believe that's yes. you. Yes. Yep. Yep. Three D O four. I'm going to have them here yet. 3D05. Yes. 3D06. In the house. 3D07. Yes. 3D08. Yes. 3D09. Yes. 3D10. Yes. All right. Let's move on. Thank you for that. Um, let's start with our police updates. Lieutenant Haskins. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, I hope everyone hears my, um, I have the microphone on, hopefully. Uh, I will try to be very brief since you all have a uh, very packed agenda and uh, and the weather is so still so nice out. Uh, the, so total um, terms of the crime report, uh, we had 13 total crimes for the month of February in um, the ANC. Uh, of those, 12 of the 13 were property crimes. One was an attempt robbery of a bank. I will say more about that momentarily. Uh, the numbers are much better than they were last year. Last year, we had uh, 24 more crimes or uh, 37 total as opposed to 13 total this year. Uh, especially with theft from autos, we only had six theft from autos in the entire month of February. So um, I can't remember the last time the theft from autos have been so low. The attempt robbery of the bank, uh, somebody went to the bank and uh, tried to pass a note. Uh, did not seem to phase the teller or tellers there because the person never got any money. Uh, he apparently has done this before because he was very, he was very quick and he also noticed when they were like bringing the alarm buttons and stuff like that. So I'm hoping we could close that one. That one might take a little bit of time because he was completely masked up and covered up. I mean, you couldn't get much better in terms of covering yourself up than that. Uh, 
I have a update on the ADW gun we had slash that from auto from Lockborough from last month. Uh, that one, uh, we got a fingerprint hit and we have a person of interest and we are hoping to uh, close that one soon. Uh, I know that the detective has to meet, I believe the victim was out of town, but has to meet the uh, detective. So we could help close that. Uh, in terms of, um, yeah, the crime, uh, we had one motor vehicle theft in the month of February. And uh, overall, I thought the numbers were pretty good, but any questions? Lieutenant, I just put a, uh, a question in the chat. I was wondering if you oh, would, if yeah, you me... were able to share what bank this was. If you said it, I missed it. I apologize. Oh, I am so sorry. I did not say it. It's the Wells Fargo on MacArthur Boulevard at the corner of MacArthur in Arizona. And uh, he just walked in. There were two customers sitting uh, with one of the, I believe, loan officers at the time. And they stuck around. They said they witnessed him walk in and walk out. It was all very thick and very brief. He uh, fled in a vehicle. Um, and uh, yeah, it was very quick because uh, MPD was there within a few minutes. And we don't believe there's any danger to the public. There was no violence or anything. Any other questions? Any questions from the neighborhood? No? Okay. Why don't we move on to traffic and speeding? If if Officer McElwee is not here on uh, for the traffic report, I can certainly handle it uh, in terms okay. of if there's any traffic issues. I certainly thought I saw him enter earlier. Riley, do you happen to see him? I thought I saw him, but I'm not seeing him now. Right. That's all right. Do you want to kick it off and and move on to traffic if you've got the stats there? Uh, I don't have the traffic stats on the tickets issued, but I do know that we've been uh, doing uh, Reservoir Road, MacArthur Boulevard, and a few uh, stop signs in Wesley Heights. Uh, if there are any other concerns, I could certainly uh, address them. Sounds like we have a month with limited speeding concerns. Uh, I find uh, that hard to believe. I'm very, yeah, I'm, it's, um, I'm hoping it'll last, uh, but, you know, we'll be ready to address them when they do occur. <laughs> uh, actually, may I ask a question? This is uh, Cliff McKinney on MacArthur Boulevard, and I, I am concerned about the speeding. I've raised the question with DDOT and with a couple of the commissioners, um, particularly during evening rush hour between 4 and 6 p.m. and early in the morning, the cars with Maryland plates are just going up and down MacArthur at very high rates of speed. And I would love to see more patrol action and something to be done about it. It's just, they get past the speed camera on MacArthur and then they just gun it all the way down towards St. Patrick's School. And it's, it happens every day. It would be great if somebody could um, stop four to, it. Uh, 4 to 6 p.m.? 4 to 6 p.m. and really, uh, 5 a.m. to about 7 a.m. in the morning. Okay, I will address that. I had one officer who was specifically assigned to do much of that, but unfortunately he had been temporarily reassigned, but he will be coming back shortly. Uh, we will address that, and hopefully uh, next month um, we could have something for you on terms of how we've addressed it. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Lieutenant Haskis, I think uh, in the chat as well, looking yep. at Foxhall Road and then uh, cut through on Volta. Okay. Um, Foxhall, uh, I'll look at the chat. Uh, speeding on Foxhall? Yeah, speeding in both places. Okay. As well as areas with young children. Cut through Meaning those cut through streets. To, from Reservoir to Foxhall. Okay. Yeah, we'll, um, 
we'll address that as well. Um, appreciate bringing that up, Volta too. I, I can speak to a very popular cut through my road, Salem Lane people um, cut through it, go very quickly, ran over my cat last month. Oh no, oh no. Yes. And when I got my cat out of the road, several people came out of their houses and told me that their animals had also been run over. And we, we've had a very significant problem with people speeding down Salem Lane. It's a cut through off of Fox Hall. So just to put, sorry to be depressing. No. So Salem, I did not know. Um, and I pride myself on knowing a lot of the um, Ish, traffic issues in the uh, ANC, uh, Salem Lane, I did not know it was one of them. So we'll-, well I would add to that um, Q Street between Fox Hall and MacArthur and, and anybody that's, I mean, Salem Lane kind of dead ends, I thought. And so they have to turn down to get to Q Street, but between Q Street, um, between- Q between MacArthur and Fox Hall. Okay. Yeah, and I see where Salem Lane. Okay. Yeah, I've seen. Okay. Yeah, I've seen some speeding on Salem Lane, actually. Um, actually, now knowing the street name of that street, that's right off Fox Hall there. I've seen the people cut through there and speed and thank not you. stop at that stop sign at Fox Hall. Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. Any other issues? Would uh, Lieutenant Haskis, would you mind staying on for maybe the next three or four minutes while a few more people add into the chat some areas of speeding? Not at all. Uh, okay. I'm just going to grab a pen and pad so I could write all of these down because I'm not going to be able to punch them all in my cell phone. All right, and then I'm we'll move on from this. Um, so if, if folks want to add more items, um, please do in the chat and then Lieutenant Haskis will add those in. Um, we can move then on from the police report to updates from local institutions. And uh, I think we'll start with Kevin, Kevin Days from uh, GW. Uh, good evening, commissioners and community members. Uh, good to see you all, even if it's uh, virtually. Uh, I wanted to do a quick overview of our community engagement kickoff uh, that we had last uh, Thursday. Um, as you may recall, last month, I announced that we were starting our community engagement process um, and that we were establishing four community advisory groups uh, to help work on the issues, to help uh, come to consensus so that when we submit our uh, campus plan uh, at the end of this year, we will have worked through any existing problems and come to consensus. Um, so we kicked off last Thursday uh, like you in a virtual meeting where the president of the university and the number two man, uh, President LeBlanc and Mark uh, Diaz came and gave a sort of high level, so here are the things that we're thinking about uh, in terms of what we'd like to do with this campus. Uh, we then had uh, the GW representatives talk about uh, their staff, people who are gonna be joining the, these working commissions and to talk about the subject area. So very briefly, uh, I just wanna say that you know, we have four working, uh, working groups. We have facilities planning, that's looking at the use of the facilities and the, and the buildings on the facility. We had student life and safety, and that's about how student life uh, occurs on the campus and its impacts in the community, uh, transportation and parking, and finally, a community engagement piece. I think I've said repeatedly that the university wants uh, the community to see the Mount Vernon campus as a resource. Uh, and this fourth work committee is uh, working committee, uh, working group is designed to figure out are there ways that we can offer more of the resources that we have on campus to community members. Uh, we are soliciting representation uh, for community members. I think we had about seven or eight community members on the call. Uh, we want to make sure that folks know about uh, these committees and that come out to these meetings to uh, provide the kind of feedback that we're looking to. Uh, we have a website, and uh, I can give you the link, although it's long. Um, what I'll do is I'll drop the link in the chat, 
But on this website, you can sign up for the working committees, one of the four working committees. You can get updates. Uh, so even if you don't join a committee, but you want to hear what is what's going on in those discussions, you can sign up for updates, meeting summary updates. Um, and you can also sign up for our newsletter, which is another vehicle we'll be using to make sure that we keep the community appraised as we move through this process. So uh, I will drop all of those links in the chat. Uh, we are hitting the ground running. Our first working committee meeting, which is the facilities planning working committee, is scheduled to meet next week, March 10th. Uh, and you can sign up to receive the link uh, on this website. Again, I'll drop the link in the chat. Uh, we hope uh, that uh, if you are near the campus, or you have interest in the campus, that you'll sign up and participate in these working groups. With that, I'll stop and see if there are any questions. Uh, one other thing I want to do a shout out to Jason. Jason, I'm sorry to hear about your cat. I know it's very traumatic uh, to lose a pet, but I also want to make sure that we touch base. Uh, we really want to give you a preview. I want to make sure that there, if there are any concerns that you specifically have, um, because you'll be the, when we come back to the ANC for approval, your colleagues will be looking to you. So we really want to make sure that you stay engaged uh, and involved and we answer any questions. So uh, we're going to be reaching out again to try to set up a meeting with you. Uh, we really want to make sure that you're in this process early uh, and that you have all the information that you need so that you can, um, when, it, when it comes to the vote, that you're really talking from a place of knowledge. Thank you, thank you, Kevin. Uh, you know, I appreciate the call out, and I I will open my schedule for um, for a briefing. And I, I apologize, it's taken some time. Thank you. Hey, we understand. All of us are in our first year of lockdown, still struggling to get our schedules coordinated. So no problems. I just knew I would see you tonight, and I wanted to make a personal appeal to make sure that we get on your schedule. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, any other questions? Um, and any questions folks want to um, put in the chat, please feel free to do so. Kevin, do you mind staying on for two or three minutes? Yeah, I'll stay on for a while. Have... I usually okay. stay on for a little bit just to see if anything comes up. So I'll Super. put all those links in the in the chat. Thanks for letting me chat. And uh, you know, one of the things is we'll be giving this report for the next year. So uh, yeah. I, you know, you'll see me a There's lot. time. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. All right. Shall we move on to American University, Maria? Barry? Sure. Hey, good evening, everyone. So I'm Maria Barry. I'm the Director of Community Relations here at American University. Um, hope you enjoyed the, this little bit of spring today. It should be coming in full force next week. Um, so I just have a couple of items. We have our uh, Community Liaison Committee meeting, our CLC, that's coming up on March 9th um, at 630. So if you haven't registered uh, for that meeting and you're interested in attending, um, please feel free to do so. The information is in our newsletter, which I'll put again, the subscribe if you're not on that already. Um, I'll put that in the chat as well as I can um, send you the registration link um, in the chat as well if you're interested in attending the community liaison committee. Um, lastly, we are um, still accepting any letters of support from uh, neighbors or neighborhood organizations who are interested in lending your support um, for our campus plan. So I uh, will drop that as well um, in the chat. And if you have any questions about any of those items um, or anything, uh, please let me know. Um, I'll put my contact in there as well. All right, thanks so much. Maria. All right, shall we move on to, is there any update, JP, for Georgetown? I do not have any update for Georgetown today. Okay, great. Uh, and, and, and honestly, the, uh, you know, Georgetown's uh, hospital is proceeding, um, uh, you know, in, in the normal course. There hasn't been any complaints that I've received, although uh, there have been some speeding truck complaints on, um, on Reservoir Road in the 4700 block, which uh, there is that uh, bump in the road that that uh, the uh, Department of Public Works is uh, trying to figure out how to fix that. And that's been the, the big conundrum, but that's only tangentially related to the hospital. Okay, thanks so much. Um, shall uh, we move Michael on to the- from the FCCA. Um, <laughs> FYI, the hospital, uh, the digging is done. So there'll be much fewer trucks on the roads, hopefully. I thought that might be helpful. Super helpful, thanks so much. All right, shall we move on to the mayor's office, Amir? 
Thank you, Commissioner. Good evening, everyone. My name is Amir Hiram. I'm going to give a quick update on the vaccine and not take up too much time. So just to reiterate, right now we're on phase 1C of the vaccination rollout, and that includes um, healthcare workers in D.C., uh, residents 65 and older, uh, residents 18 to 65 with medical conditions, and uh, four, four classes of essential workers. That includes grocery store workers, workers in food packaging, social outreach, and manufacturing. And uh, 16 to 17 year olds with medical conditions can sign up for the Children's Hospital. So the rest of those all, all go through vaccinate.dc.gov. And we have some new big updates regarding uh, that website as well. As we've seen with last week's fiasco, uh, we needed a whole new overhaul of the vaccination rollout system. And so the past week, uh, DC Health and Octo, that's the Office of Chief Technology Officer, have been in talks with Microsoft as to how they can improve the user experience. So to reiterate, last week we had about 3,500 appointments go out on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Saturday was only for uh, residents with underlying conditions and priority wards. And uh, we saw what happened. Uh, people couldn't get on the website at all. It was too laggy. They weren't able to get past the questionnaire. They weren't able to get past the CAPTCHA and most people were left unhappy and disappointed. So this week we've increased the allotment, first of all, to 5,750 Thursday and Friday. And again, Thursday will be the priority day. We don't have any plans for a Saturday morning rollout at this time. Uh, and this week it's only for residents 65 and older and residents with medical conditions. So this week alone, uh, the essential worker group cannot sign up for the vaccine. That doesn't mean they're not qualified anymore. That's only for this week. Uh, and we are also, uh, Microsoft also had some changes to their web design. They uh, improved server capacity and uh, they also added a waiting room, allowing only 3,000 people at a time on the questionnaire uh, to, increase, to decrease the chances of the servers getting overloaded. And after this week, this is the biggest change. After this week, DC will switch to a pre-registration system as many in the community have been asking for. So basically in this uh, situation, individuals will provide their information to DC Health and pre-register for a slot on the uh, vaccine wait list. And when their slot is available to them, they will be notified either by email, uh, phone, text message, any which way they want, that they have the opportunity to choose an appointment. And we're also still maintaining uh, priority ward focusing by making sure that half of each week's appointments will be, made, will be uh, ensured to go to priorities at code residents. So that's about it for updates from the vaccine uh, aspect. Any questions from the community? Now, if no one has questions, you can also leave it in the chat and I'll be sure to leave my contact information as always. So thank you everyone. Thanks so much, Amir. Do we have uh, someone from Mary Che's office here? Is, is Mendelssohn here? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Uh, any other institutions that I have not called on who would like to speak? No? All right. We will move on to commissioner updates and community news. And why don't we just, um, we'll, we'll go down um, starting with 01 with Commissioner Elkins. And please feel free to say pass. Commissioner Ila, just a quick note. We have two hands raised, it looks like, or at least one. Oh. Okay, I don't see them. Um, My apologies. Nicole McEntee. Yeah, hello. I'm sorry. Um, I, I wasn't quick with the draw there. <laughs> um, I'm from the Office of the Tenant Advocate, and um, I just wanted to um, just kind of pop into the meeting really quickly because we're trying to do outreach to um, all of the wards um, over the course of the next several weeks, um, just to kind of explain who we are. We're the Office of Tenant Advocate in DC, so um, we advocate for tenants' rights um, and, 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 uh, you know, housing conditions and, um, uh, forming, uh, tenant associations and all of those things, um, throughout the city. Um, and we wanted to make residents and commissioners aware that we exist and that we're a resource here, um, for anyone who's having difficulties with their landlord and wants to know their rights as a tenant. 
um, especially because with the public health emergency about to expire, we anticipate there's going to be, um, frankly, an eviction crisis throughout the city. Um, so we're really trying to be proactive and get a head start on our outreach as much as possible um, so that people are aware and, and people can um, prepare for this. So we're encouraging anyone, any commissioners or any community members um, who are tenants or who know of tenants who might be struggling to pay their rent or who might be struggling with um, you know, substandard housing conditions or just concerns about their landlord, um, please contact us um, or send anyone you know our info. Um, you can reach our tenant hotline at 202-719-6560. Again, that's 202-719-6560. That's our tenant hotline. Um, and when you call that number, you're connected with the case uh, manager. So, so you know, your issue can be addressed um, with our team. And this is all for free. Um, and then you can also go to our website, ota.dc.gov. Um, and again, if you have anyone you know, um, please spread the word. We're trying to get the word out as, as quick as we can. We, we anticipate there's going to be a real problem in the city. Um, so commissioners, if, if you have anyone in your um, SMDs or any constituents um, that need our help, please let us know. And I'll drop my information in the chat as well. Uh, Commissioner Ela, um, may I ha ask for permission to move my landlord tenant um, matter up to the beginning of the official action so uh, Ms. McEntee can uh, uh, answer any questions if, if the community has any um, questions about uh, her role since my uh, resolution um, relates directly to what she does for a living? Um, procedurally, I don't know if now that we've, um, well, it's, adopted it's, it's just a matter, agenda. it's just a matter to, uh, of, of moving them of around placement, in the official yes. actions, yeah, the placement, not, yes, moving it to I understand. Place. Yeah. Uh, I guess, uh, Sariki, uh, since you're our Roberts, Roberts rules expert, is this something we can do or Ben, you might know. I don't know. I'm happy to stay on as well. Um, I'm, I'm happy to stay on through until I think you had it Is about it the, eight o'clock or so. So it's for um, for allowing the, the representative on JP to, to uh, comment on your, on your uh, letter. <laughs> Yeah, th this is something that, that really the Office of Tenant Advocacy is going to be um, dealing with, um, you know, for the next three or four years, uh, people this, facing eviction. Let's leave it the way it is, because we've got a lot of people. If, if Nicole, if you're willing to stay on and, and wait, we've got a lot of people sort of relying on the, the way that this agenda is listed right now. I'm sorry, JP. I think it's gonna make sense just to keep us in the same order. Thank you, yeah, Nicole, absolutely. for being generous with your time. Absolutely. And if you have any Thank other you. questions for me, I'm gonna drop my um, contact information and our tenant hotline number in the chat box for anyone in the community. Thanks so much, appreciate it. Um, any other institutions here? No. Okay. We will move on to commissioner updates. And I think we're going to start with a one with uh, Commissioner Elkins. I pass. Thank you. Okay. Elizabeth? No updates. Commissioner, no updates. Okay. No updates for me. No updates, Madam Chairman. Madam no Chairman. updates from three to 10. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Are we on five? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to uh, congratulate uh, one of our neighbors, Mr. Uh, Gordon Kitt, who had his house uh, approved as a historic site by the Historic Preservation Board. Uh, this is the Bazelon McGovern uh, house. So I just wanted to thank all of uh, my fellow commissioners for your support and uh, wanted to share the successful outcome. Congratulations, uh, Gordon. Thanks, Kate. All right, any other commissioner updates? Yeah, I, I have a quick one. I was gonna bring this up. Uh, well, I'll, I'll let it, Christian, do you have anything or I skipped over you? Uh, no, I have no updates. Okay, so I, I was gonna bring this up with uh, council member Che's office, but I just wanted to share uh, with the community in case people haven't seen, I, I really would recommend um, reading the statement 
that council member Che uh, put out about the comprehensive plan. I think it's a really detailed um, discussion of the various issues facing this ward. She talks a lot about some of the, the, the pulls and, and, and pressures on, on development. And, and she talks about um, the need to, to care about neighborhood uh, character and historic preservation in certain neighborhoods, and also balance the need for um, greater density, which uh, she has some, some powerful and I think unexpected quotes about the need uh, for density. And she makes the one point that I, I think is really a strong point that uh, regardless, even if greater density weren't certain to provide more affordable housing, capping density is certain to constrain affordable housing. I think it's a really good read, so I recommend it. Um, that's all I wanna say. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. Other updates from commissioners? Uh, no update from, uh, from me, 3D09. Okay, thanks so much. All right, why don't we um, move on to any community concerns and updates. These are not items that are already on our agenda. So if you are here to specifically discuss a concern uh, surrounding anything, either in discussions or official actions, this is not the time. But if you have something uh, that you do want to discuss that is not on our agenda or tangentially related to the agenda, now is a great time. All right, we will move on from there. Um, why don't we move to, we've got, a, we've got a lot of transportation items on our list. So uh, we'll start with Commissioner Elkins and his presentation on the DDOT um, bike lane for New Mexico, Ton Law 37. Well, thank you. Uh, you're right. We have had a number of uh, transportation issues uh, in this opening couple of months. Uh, I think, uh, um, part of that is uh, because these issues come up and part of it is because we've had a very active transportation committee, but I can assure you that uh, the commission will have many other topics as we go forward. So we will not be dominating the, <laughs> the agenda with transportation all the time. So we have a very important one today and that is um, a proposal to uh, upgrade the, um, the uh, bike lane on New Mexico Avenue and then connecting to Tunlaw and 37th Street um, um, the, the purpose of today's uh, discussion is simply to hear from uh, DDOT um, uh, in a very short presentation and then open it up for concerns that we can then take up as we go forward. There will be no, we're not recommending any decision at this point. We, this is an opening up of the discussion and make sure that we get plenty of, of uh, public discussion. So I want to turn this over to um, uh, I believe uh, Mike, Michael Goodnow uh, to kick this off uh, with a short presentation just so people can get oriented and then we'll open it up to questions from commissioners and from the audience. Uh, great, thank you, Commissioner. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen if I'm able to, is that okay? Um, well, I'm trying to, okay, I got it there. Everyone can see this. Uh, yeah, everybody can see my screen. Yes, we see your screen. Thank you. Um, I'm going to keep this brief because we presented last week and at the transportation committee and went a bit long. So we really cut back the presentation really just to focus on the portion of New Mexico within the ANC's boundaries. I'm here tonight with my colleague Gilberto Solano, who will also be presenting, and also two other colleagues, Donise Jackson and George Branion. So getting right into it, uh, we're looking at um, a pretty long corridor of two miles of 37th Tunwa and New Mexico. And going from Reservoir Road in the south all the way up to Nebraska Avenue. And the different colors or different bike facilities are, are in place right now. The blue is just what we call a shared lane. There's no dedicated space for bikes, just a marking on the road um, that shows that bikes could be present and shows them where to ride outside the park vehicles. We have climbing lanes, which is a bike lane in only the uphill direction. That's the brown line. And green are bike lanes where it's on both sides of the road. Just want to point out there are a lot of schools surrounding the area. And one kind of objective for this project is really to improve the safety 
of people biking and walking in the neighborhood, but also to schools. I'm gonna to go to the next slide. Um, one thing we took a look at is the, the crashes along the corridor. And here you can see it just broke out the crashes on New Mexico Avenue. And the two maps here, uh, the one in the middle is showing property damage and injury crashes. There were 30 of those within the years 2017, 18 and 19, and 12 of those crashes were injury. And the pie chart on the top left here shows the crash types. Interestingly, almost half of them were side swipes and rear end crashes. So I pulled up the police reports and I looked into um, what happened in each crash. The officer on the scene puts a description of what occurred. And so a lot of the side swipes and rear ends were people stopped at red lights or stopped in traffic and someone wasn't paying attention for the rear end and crashed into them. Side swipe were usually someone was switching a lane, um, didn't judge it correctly or didn't see the car and hit them. So human error for the most part. There was one bicycle crash that occurred down at Garfield Street and that happened from an eastbound car trying to make the left turn at New Mexico and a bicyclist was going southbound in the shared lane. Usually when something like that happens is that maybe the driver couldn't adequately see the oncoming traffic. So one kind of countermeasure we would do is potentially pull back the parking or any other obstruction to make the sight lines visible. And, and part of this project is not only upgrading the bike facilities, but really looking at other countermeasures, how we can improve safety for all users. There were three head crashes um, as well. I also wanna point out on the right, there was four injury crashes within one block, Klingle to Lowell. So I looked into what was happening there. One of the crashes, someone was backing up out of the alley um, on Lowell Street and they were hit by an eastbound car. Um, another crash, there was a southbound car in New Mexico turning left on the Sutton Place. There was a pedestrian walking on the east side of the road and the driver unfortunately crashed into that pedestrian. Um, another crash, a northbound driver uh, rear-ended someone who was stopped in traffic. They happened to be reaching down to retrieve a water bottle and they weren't looking um, at the roadway. And finally, there was a scooter rider going southbound in the northbound bike lane on the east side of the road and was hit by a left turning car who did not expect that scooter rider to be coming that way. So I'm gonna turn it over to Gilberto now who will talk a little bit about existing conditions and the two alternatives that we're proposing. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I'll take it back uh, on where Mike left off as far as the car crashes and it also just indicate that uh, in this particular case, we have uh, an upgrade that we're proposing for a bike lane, existing bike facility. And uh, bike facilities um, are looked at as, you know, uh, safety measures, safety elements that improve the safety for all modes of, of users. So um, as you can see in this slide, we have an example of an existing condition um, at the north end and south end of New Mexico. So on one side, you see the shadows, you see the parking, uh, going northbound, and then on the opposite side, going southbound, you see parking, RPP parking, uh, you see a bus stop further down the road. Um, but the illustrations to the right gives you an idea with alternative one of what a standard bike lane uh, on both sides would look like. Um, as you can see, there, there's basically uh, some markings, some symbols uh, to alert drivers as they, as they drive up and down the corridor that there's a bike lane there. And then alternative two, which is a cycle track, which provides some protection uh, with concrete barriers. Um, as you can see, it's going in one direction. And well, it's on one side of the corridor, uh, and you'll be able to travel in both directions on the cycle track. Uh, next slide. So, so here gives you a, a, a great illustration of the cross sections that we're discussing. Uh, in New Mexico, we're looking at uh, 140 parking spaces uh, that's existing. So uh, as far as the alternatives and the impacts and parking loss, uh, you're looking at maybe 54 parking spaces. 
Uh, I want to emphasize too that we are aware of the uh, loading activities that are around there, um, also to the meter parking. So with the alternatives, uh, you you will lose some parking, but less is more. I think that the less frequency of having maybe um, you know more uh, less crashes or try to prevent some, but in the same token, you can also with having more, you'll have more opportunity to increase the safety with a, a bicycle lane and upgrade to the existing bicycle lane. Next slide, please. So this is, this is a table which is very helpful as far as to get a, a big picture view, but also understand where and how each alternative is gonna impact the parking loss. So if you could uh, bring your eyes over to uh, the column where it says uh, number of parking spaces removed, alternate bike gives you an idea of what will be lost in parking uh, if we were to explore an um, alternate one. Alternate two would be uh, 67 parking spaces uh, and that's with the cycle track. So right next to each of those totals, there are percentages of what percentage of that particular corridor would we'll lose as far as parking. Uh, next slide. Now, this is, this is a great illustration, uh, give you an aerial bird's eye view of the number of parking and also to the location. The other thing too, it also shows you, um, if you look at the alternatives, gives you a breakdown of where those 54 uh, parking spaces are currently at and the impact it would have if we were to go with alternate one and alternate two. So as you can see, if you look further up, uh, there is three spaces for uh, loading. Uh, there is existing right now, a bike lane that is going southbound. And as of right now, we have a Cheryl going up, a climbing lane going up towards uh, Nebraska. Uh, next slide. Great, and um, I can take it over from here. Okay. But, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so since we're removing parking on New Mexico Avenue, we thought it would be helpful to get an idea of how much parking is available on the side streets and how well it's been utilized. Um, because it would take a long time to actually go out there and do a survey, we did a desktop survey using a few programs. You can see in the lower left, step one, a program called Street Smart. Each one of these green dots is a picture of the roadway. So we went on each of the side streets um, looked at the parking signs to see what type of parking is out there today. Um, then in step two, we actually measured the curb face um, and assumed 20 feet for each parking space. And there's setbacks from, from intersections and driveways that were taken into an account. We counted that all up. And then we counted on two different days, February 21st, 2020 and March 7th, 2020. Now this was pre-COVID and it was during the day um, we can kind of guess what time of day by the shadows on the car, but we're not exactly sure. Um, there was a recent photo taken fe February 25th, 2021. We get photos every three months. So we could potentially do a post COVID survey, but if we were to do an evening one, um, we'd actually have to physically go out there because we need to have, obviously need to see the cars and there can't be any tree cover, it can't be dark. So here's what we found out. Starting on the right side, all the green lines represent residential permit parking. So you can park there all day if you um, have a, a permit, otherwise two hour parking for visitors. Uh, the red lines are no parking is allowed. There's some metered parking on a couple areas and some school parking with the dark blue. And so it went block by block and the, the table on the lower right has the number of parking spaces on each of those roads. And then the total we observed on each of the two dates in February and in March and the percent occupied. We found in this whole area here, there are just over a thousand parking spaces and the utilization of that parking was about 20%. So somewhere around 80% of the parking was available for use. So, one comment we got is, well, it might be too far to walk all the way to 45th Street to park your car. So we just did one block off the corridor. We ran the numbers, um, about 375 parking spaces, a little bit higher utilization, around 25%, but still a lot of available parking in the area. 
Just want to point out to the South, Tun Law in 37, they had much higher utilization. It was around 60 to 70 percent. Um, so still some availability, but much better utilized down there. Um, so I, I wanted to preemptively answer a few questions that were asked ahead of time. So I've got the questions on the left, the answers on the right. Um, hopefully we'll have time for a few more questions after the presentation. This is the final slide. So someone asked, what if we just put a protected bike lane in the uphill side only, and then um, downhill um, bikes and cars could share the road? Um, that's feasible. Um, there wouldn't really be any gain. We still wouldn't be able to preserve parking on both sides because New Mexico is about 40 feet wide. We need about 44 to 45 feet to preserve the parking and have um, the, the protected bike lane and the shared lane. Um, it also doesn't provide some of the safety benefits of a dedicated lane. and doesn't provide the comfort that a user would have of having a protected bike lane in both directions. So, you know, they can go to their destination protected, but coming back, they might not be able to do that. So what about removing parking on the west side? There'd be, I think you'd lose 10 or 11 parking spaces less. And um, absolutely, we, we could do that. I think it would require a little bit of a centerline shift. One of the reasons we chose um, removing the parking on the east side is mainly because down on Tunwa, there is a lot more residential parking on the west side of the road. Um, I do want to point out, though, that we aren't removing the parking, no matter what, in front of the businesses between Lowell and Macomb. That is there today, and that would remain. Someone asked about the cost of parking. Right now, it's $50 for an RPP sticker. If you are to actually park in a lot, it varies, but around the city, two to $3,000 per year. And it costs about thirty dollars to $60,000 to build an underground parking space. Um, also in the Rock Creek Far West livability study, which wrapped up in 2019, they recommended curb extensions, which um, go out into the roadway seven or eight feet, usually do them with the parking lane, increases the visibility of pedestrians or crossing the road, also reduces the amount of roadway they have to cross. Uh, with the bike project, we could still do the curb outs and we would integrate them into the project. We just can't do them where the bikes would be. We can't block the bikes. So next steps, we're here tonight. Uh, we came last week. Last month, we presented the ANC 3B. There's also a third ANC 2E, which has a few blocks on 37. We're going to talk to them on the 30th of this month. And then we want to use all the feedback we received and develop some conceptual plans over the summer. We'd like to circulate those plans to the ANC and then come back and, and talk once again about it. Our goal would be that we would be ready if we're going to proceed with the project to put out a notice of intent that would start the official comment period sometime in the winter maybe december or january february and then hopefully we could build the project next summer or fall in 2022 so uh, this is our contact information be happy to answer any questions now if there's time otherwise please reach out by email or telephone and uh Thank you very much, everyone. I'll stop sharing the screen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Goodno. I, that, that was very helpful. And, and I thank would you. like to open it up for some uh, qu questions or comments. I would urge people, uh, this is not the time to get a definitive answer. This is the time to raise issues, which we can then take up later. So if you see issues that were not covered in this presentation, um, that um, that you would like to make sure that are considered as we go forward. Uh, if you could do that concisely, that would be helpful. So um, uh, let's look to see whether there are people that, that would like to be recognized. Oh, uh, hi. Uh, can I go ahead? Um, and is this including a discussion about Tun Law? Are we just talking about New Mexico? Well, if we could talk just about New Mexico at this point, I'd appreciate it. We will, when we, in the future, we'll have to take talk about the whole issue, but right now, it would be helpful we could focus on New Mexico. Okay, uh, my comments relate to Title 137. So, okay. thank you, uh, Mr. Heimer. Um, yeah, Mike. Thanks very much. Um, the, the real quick question I had is, in, in terms of moving forward, um, if this ANC wanted you to think about 
different alternatives. For example, the, the idea of, of uh, removing the parking on the, on the west side of, of New Mexico rather than the east side. At, at what point would input of that nature um, be helpful and, and would you need it so that you can move forward on, on your schedule or, or so it works within the schedule you've set out, whether that ultimately is the schedule? Yeah, I think over the next month or so, uh, because after the March 30th meeting, uh, maybe a couple weeks later, we'd like to get started developing the conceptual plans. And that could take anywhere from two to four weeks. So I, I think we still have four to six weeks to make any comments and try to integrate it into those plans. And of course, once we get those plans, we're willing to take more comments again, certainly. Let me turn next to Griff Johnson. <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> thank you, Commissioner Elkins, and thank you, Mr. Goodno and Mr. Solano. Um, I'll be brief. My concern is not at all with the proposal, which I think is an excellent idea. I think it's, an, it's a great idea to encourage biking and to extend the uh, uh, places where bikers can uh, travel as opposed to using automobiles. But with, you, with the elimination of parking spaces on, um, uh, on New Mexico, there is going to be some degree of migration of those parkers onto the side streets. And as someone who lives just one house away from New Mexico on Lowell, I happen to walk around a great deal of the side streets, uh, including Garfield and Klingle and Cathedral. Uh, and Macomb. And uh, I noticed that a number of my neighbors are elderly people who um, uh, may have some difficulty if they're asked to park some diff different uh, distance away from their homes. And they also, many of them have caretakers who come in from Virginia or Maryland to look after them during the day. And the concern I have is that if these um, uh, parking spaces are eliminated, and I understand why, and I think it's a good idea, but if they are eliminated, there is going to be a uh, forced migration of those people who are parking onto the side streets and that including 44th, which is, which is a north south street. Um, and that's going to cause some of my elderly neighbors uh, who are not ambulatory easily um, to have to find parking that may not be close to their homes. It's not an issue for me. I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm fortunate in having a garage. My wife and I have a garage, so it's not for us to worry about, but I do notice that some of my elderly neighbors would have to be inconvenienced and to some extent might be more serious in the case of uh, seasonal uh, weather conditions and inclement weather. So I wonder, Mr. Goodnow and Mr. Solano, if you've taken those secondary considerations into your uh, calculus. Yeah, with these projects, there always are some difficult trade-offs. Um, one thing we do do is look at curbside uses and we look at, um, can we put in maybe a pickup drop-off zone? Um, and if we know of specific areas where maybe an elderly person needs to have readily um, accessible space, um, that's something we could look at on that block, designating a little space so it would be available for pickup and drop-off. Uh, that is a possibility. Um, otherwise, sometimes, Maybe they'd have to drop off quickly and then park the car somewhere else. Um, Commissioner Bergman. Yeah, I, I'll just be very brief. I just have a question sort of about trade-offs and I, I guess it was a response to um, the answers you had in that last slide. Uh, I, I appreciate why uh, you chose the side you chose to remove parking because of the effect on Tunlop. The, the problem is that it's the the opposite story on New Mexico, where uh, a lot of the apartment buildings that, that use the parking more are on the other side. So I'm wondering, is it possible, A, I guess, is it possible to do, to somehow change the lane? I, that seems complicated for the biker. And, and I don't know if it's even possible to run it along, you know, one side in New Mexico and then on the other side on Tunla. And then separately, to what extent, um, I know we are proceeding only in evaluating New Mexico, but this is a question. If, if the answer to, to my previous question is that it has to be the same way along the whole corridor, that's the best solution. To what extent are we have, do we have to work with the other A and C and, and kind of one of us loses, one of us wins 
how, how are we dealing with that question? I yeah. guess. Well, if we were to do the two-way bike option, the cycle track option, we'd want to keep it on one side of the road for the whole corridor. But what we could do, the parking could shift from one side of the road to the, to the other. It would require a little bit of a taper, um, maybe 75 to 100 feet. There might be a little parking loss in, during that. But I think it would work somewhere around 42nd Street um, or between Garfield and 42nd, taper it over. And the parking could be adjacent. Say, say we did the bike lane, the two-way on the east side of the road. The parking could be adjacent to it on that side of the road yet. Um, one reason we put it opposite the bikeway is that when you get out of the car, you, you'd have to cross over the bikeway, which we've heard some people don't necessarily like doing, but we do have other bikeways throughout the city that have parking next to them. So I think we could work out the parking shifting around a little bit. It's already shifting right now um, in the business section between um, Lowell and Macomb, where it's on the east side. Then the block before, it's on the west side. So it is possible. So um, I guess I didn't make it clear. I, I, I'm only looking to see who has raised their hand in the, uh, in the list of participants. So I do not at this point see any other member of the audience or the commissioners. Um, uh, but I see Barbara raising her finger. <laughs> I know how to do that. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Barbara. <laughs> no, I, I, I just wondered if you'd considered, um, I know in certain parts of the city where you've uh, taken parking away, uh, for example, on, on Capitol Hill, you actually have residence um, stickers, at least on one side of the street. And have you thought about doing that, especially on those first blocks where I think they will be greatly affected right off of uh, New Mexico? Yeah, there are portions um, adjacent to Tunlaw. I think it's on 37th Street and there's one other street that eludes me right now where they have the resident only parking. Mm -hmm. um, so we could work with our partners at DDOT um, who implement that throughout the city. Usually they choose a certain side of the road. Um, sure. I mean, it, it, it may push the traffic, I mean, the parking further up into our neighborhood, but at least it would protect some of the people who, who do have ambulatory problems or, you know, I think I, I get that. Right, that's, that's a good point. It would make more parking available for those people. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, I think this has been a good discussion. If there are not any other comments, let's talk about going forward. Uh, I think- I a Quick good... question. Oh yes, go right ahead. Um, I wonder, I used to live on 42nd and W and there they have the back end parking spaces, which seem like they're extremely, you know, efficient in terms of fitting the most number of parking spaces into one spot. And I wonder if you've ever looked into doing a cycle track on one side and back end parking spaces on the other to preserve parking. Yeah. Um, yeah, we actually have it on Vermont Avenue downtown by um, the Veterans Administration in the White House area. There's back end parking. Usually you need a pretty wide road because I believe you need about 17 to 19 feet. Um, but if you did have it on one side of the road, it's 40 feet wide now with two travel lanes. The parking uh, gets pretty tight here, I think. Um, that might be a little bit difficult to fit the bikeway in again. Uh, we could look at it, but usually you need a little bit more space. But then you could certainly get more parking. I notice in the chat that Mr. Branion has mentioned that uh, someone who uh, does have an ambulatory challenge uh, could possibly uh, apply for a ADA parking spot. So that's another thing we can consider as we go forward. So mm -hmm. in terms of the process, um, I, I, I would like to refer this back to the uh, uh, transportation committee and, and dialogue with the uh, Department of Transportation. And we would ask that if anyone else um, or your neighbors have concerns that uh, you uh, communicate with the ANC uh, by uh, uh, going to the ANC uh, website and looking for the contact us and send us an email. Um, um, and uh, we'll take those comments into the transportation committee. We'll consider this and, uh, and uh, working with the Department of Transportation, we'll, we'll look for are there alternatives and et cetera. And then we'll be back. I, it sounds based on your, your schedule, uh, uh, Mr. Grindel, it sounds to me like we, maybe we ought to try to be back at our April uh, meeting to try to um, see, be more definitive then about where, where we're coming out on this. 
Uh, so we're trying to meet that schedule. So thank you very much for being here uh, this evening. We appreciate it and um, look forward to working with you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, shall we move on to the general update from the Transportation Committee? And, and I'll just note it's 8 o'clock, um, so I think we're doing okay. We want to start official actions at 8.30. Um, I think that really falls to me, um, uh, Madam Chairman, and I, I'll just say that the um, committee um, is um, uh, waiting to uh, meet with the Department of Transportation about the two letters that we, uh, the ANC sent in. Uh, we have uh, assurance that those meetings uh, can, can and will be scheduled. Um, and so we're looking forward to that. And um, going forward, there are a number of safety issues which, which the Transportation Committee is looking at. And of course, now we have this bike plan. So I think uh, at this point, unless uh, the Commission has other uh, things to uh, suggest to the Transportation Committee, I think we have a full agenda and uh, we'll just keep uh, checking along and where we have things that need the ANC action, we'll bring them back. Sounds like a plan. Thank you. And thanks for all the hard work. Uh, those who are on the transportation committee here, thank you for the time and, and thought that you've put into all the work that you're doing. Um, with that, we're going to move on to um, some research that um, Commissioner Bergman has, has completed on committees across DC. And so I'll move it over to you. Thank you. Riley, are you able to, to uh, put, throw that uh, document up on the screen? Yes, I'll put it up. Great. So I'll just be very brief. I don't want to, it's a busy meeting. I know most people are not here to learn about committees. Um, but so basically, I, I um, you know, I think many of us have seen the, the good work the Transportation Committee has done for ANC 3D. I think one of the um, things that I've been most impressed by, by, by the committee is that it, it has produced really thoughtful researched reports and letters that go beyond the kind of one, two page sense of the commission that we would have defaulted to previously, you know, we like sidewalks. The <laughs> transportation committee put in, you know, was able to leverage the community to really create detailed letters that really specified, you know, where we want sidewalks or we don't want sidewalks, et cetera. Um, and I think there's a value to that. There's also, um, a fair amount of work uh, that is involved. And so a, a committee is only as good as um, its members and is uh, only as good as uh, the community interest in it. But so I just want to, I, 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 this started as me thinking about um, the number of different education and sort of youth related issues that th this ANC uh, is dealing with this term. We're gonna talk about some today, but there are others. Um, and then I sort of got interested in what other commissions have done. And you can see here, I just, it's not very scientific research. I just went to all the websites of all the different ANCs and saw if they had committees and there are a range. Um, most, a lot of ANCs have zoning um, committees, uh, which is something that if there's interest in could be useful. I think that tends to be in, in, in um, areas closer to downtown or areas with a lot of historic preservation issues. Um, but, uh, the main, the main point, I just wanted to throw this up here and kind of get people thinking. The people who are here in this, in, at the meeting on the Zoom are probably most likely to be uh, potentially interested in being involved in, in this effort. Um, and, and I'm gonna, you know, I'll put some of this on the listserv, but I think these are what exists. Doesn't mean um, these could be the only topics that an ANC could form a committee on. Uh, I, our, community has a lot of seniors disproportionately compared to other ANCs. And so I think that's another place where we could, um, there could be a value in having a group of people get together and think about these issues. Um, and, and, but if you are interested, if you're in the audience and you see one of these things and think I would really like to volunteer um, to attend a meeting once a month, put in a couple hours, um, you know, each month or, or every few months on, on this, um, and help the ANC produce um, both research uh, reports that kind of that really um, uh, are helpful to agencies, but also these can be forums to deal with 
controversial issues that deserve more time. I think the bike lane discussion we just had, if we didn't have a transportation committee and we were dealing with that only in 15 minutes, a lot of member, community members would feel disappointed. People were felt disappointed about the time that we that we allocated it to at the transportation committee, um, but still it provides additional time for people to really think through um, issues, particularly because a lot of things that we deal with, there are um, persuasive arguments on both sides. And so um, there is a role for some of these committees. That's all. Um, this is on the ANC website. As Riley can show you, I collected some of the, on the other pages, some of kind of the summaries of what some of these committees do. Some of them are kind of different. Um, I kind of, I group things together, but there are some commissions that kind of have a sort of, you know, their own spin on a, on a, pub, on a public safety committee or on a parks committee, and they group it with things that are relevant to their community. Um, and when we can do the same, if there's sufficient interest. So if you're interested, please email me and we can talk about this in subsequent meetings. And I will turn it back. Right. Help us ben, stay on, agenda, on the agenda, unless there's any comments. Yeah, Ben, this is Jack Wells. I just have one quick question. Uh, do the ANCs that are adjacent to us, like uh, 3E, 3B, 3C, and 2E, do any of them have transportation committees? They do not have any committees, as far as I could tell, based upon um, their uh, websites. Doesn't mean they don't have committees. I think let's, that's a, an important caveat to all of this. Um, websites can be, uh, some of the websites for ANCs are broken. And so uh, there's a question mark, um, but they, they currently don't. Most of the, I'd say the, the, the ANCs with the most committees tend to be the ones in the DuPont area, um, around Capitol Hill, um, Adams Morgan, areas where you can imagine that there are protracted fights about certain issues and there are, um, or there's a lot of volume of certain things like restaurants needing to renew their alcohol license. And so the committee is set up to kind of deal with that and not elongate meetings for hours and hours and hours. Um, but there are some, there are, um, there is a range. There are committees in every, in ANC, every there's an ANC in every ward that has a committee. Um, but I, I think um, maybe actually it looks like Ward 8 does not have any committees, but for the most part, um, that's the case. Because there are certainly issues like transportation and education that cut across ANC boundaries, and it would certainly be nice to coordinate with other ANCs in uh, Ward 3, especially that uh, have committees both in education and transportation. No, that's well, that's an interesting idea about a cross ANC committee. I don't know what the legal issues would be, um, but that is an interesting idea. Thank you. We've still never had a joint meeting. It's one thing we've never done. I propose we don't have a joint meeting, Mr. Sreek. <laughs> All right, um, any other questions for Ben? And, and Jack, I agree with you on uh, broader collaboration across ANCs, specifically those that are adjacent to us. Um, all right, we can move on to uh, Ms. Jackson and a quick presentation from DDOT. Hi, everybody. Um, can I share my screen? Yes, you're allowed to. Yes, so, uh, one second. Okay. Should be able to now. Okay, I'm gonna try. Um, just wanted to give a quick um, overview and reintroduction of myself and uh, the agency. I'm looking for how to uh share my screen one second um, also... riley would you like to provide instructions for Zoom? yeah i believe it's at the bottom of if you just scroll down a little menu will pop up if you go down to mm -hmm. the bottom of the screen like where you have um your reactions there should be a green screen share or... right right i uh, see okay I'll pass. is it uh called share screen Right, it says whiteboard. Let's see. 
Well, maybe the, the presentation that you want to give, Denise, needs to be up on your browser or on some program. Oh, okay. You know, showing at this time so that when, the, when you click on the button, it basically shows only those windows that are open on your computer at this time. Oh, am I able to send it, uh, send it to you guys? Um, it's fine. I'll just go. <laughs> so I um, wanted to run through, uh, for those of you that don't know, our director um, is now Everett Lott. He will be the interim director um, at DDOT. Uh, and uh, for those of you that have had a chance to meet him, you know that he is uh, very focused on the community engagement aspect of what we do at DDOT. Um, um, also some uh, accomplishments that we've had across the district in 2020 were that we paved more than 131 miles of roadway. Um, we have expanded bike infrastructure by six miles. Um, some things, some War Three wins were um, the 24 miles of roadway that were, was completed in FY20 for Ward 3, uh, more than six and a half miles of sidewalks in Ward 3. And there have been about 106 alleys that were completed uh, since the launch of Alley Palooza in 2015. Um, going through some of the services that DDOT provides, uh, safety, uh, Vision Zero, traffic safety assessments are uh, some services that we provide also Infrastructure and asset management is our roadways, sidewalks, alleys, bridges, tunnels, street lights, things of that nature. Um, under the Move DC services are services like Capital Bike Share, um, DC Circulator, and Streetcar. Um, quality of life services would be urban forestry and street, uh, street tree maintenance. Public space and curbside management would be our permits, parking, um, and inspections units with DDOT. During the pandemic, uh, DDOT has uh, mobilized a couple of initiatives to help with the uh, social distancing, such as slow streets. For those of you that are aware, um, Share Your Place, I believe, is the location in 3D that has uh, received the barriers and 15 mile an hour speed limit. Um, the street is local traffic only and used uh, as a way to help residents social distance while they commute or walk through their neighborhoods. Uh, DC Streetery is also another initiative that came out of COVID-19 uh, response. The Streeteries help uh, outdoor diners be able to social distance as well as people that are utilizing the sidewalks. Also, we have piloted uh, about three bus priority or bus only lanes. Um, they can be found at 7th Street, M Street Southeast or Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue. These bus only lanes help to improve travel times and reliability. Um, so some Ward 3 projects that you all may be aware of are the Cleveland Park Streetscape and Drainage Project. Um, that's a two-phase project that uh, is going on currently. Uh, phase one, which is the drainage component, uh, was completed as of March 2020, and the construction is anticipated for summer of 2021. Phase two of the project is the streetscape, which is about to begin the design phase uh, in March of this year. The design will take about 18 months to complete. Another project would be Connecticut Avenue, reversible lanes. Um, there's been a lot of engagement with the community action committee, as well as the project manager, Edward Stoloff, has been making his rounds um, to ANC meetings to provide an update for the study. Something that you all would uh, keep an eye out for would be the public meeting um, slash study update. It's scheduled uh, to be a two part or two night update 
um, on March 31st and April 1st. And there the manager will provide updates on the alternatives for the study. Also wanted to give a refresher on DC 311. So 311 is the first step for a lot of DDOT services. Um, submitting a 311 is important because it helps generate a service request number that allows us to track where your request is uh, within the queue, as well as any movement that's happened. Um, also, when you submit a service request, you will receive uh, a timeline or service level agreement that we uh, call it. They are typically um, tend to be off putting when you first see it, but I encourage everyone to not be discouraged by the timeline as most services are able are able to be completed within uh, the time frame or before. Um, the Move DC initiative is our long range transportation plan. I understand that ANC 3D has submitted some letters uh, to DDOT uh, about Move DC and um, hoping that that's moving in a positive direction. Um, I do ask that everyone try to participate in the survey and um, because it's open until the 31st of March. Also, um, the PAVE DC website will, will be the public facing uh, section for our plans for roadways, sidewalks, alleys, and markings for 2021. The list will be published in late spring, but if you have any other locations, I encourage you to please get the service request in and share it with myself so that I can alert the team. The website will be uh, ddot.dc.gov slash pavedc for uh, where you can find that information. Also wanna go through the traffic safety assessment process. Um, the traffic safety assessment process is one that uh, tends to require some education. Um, so TSAs or traffic safety assessments are required for any type of traffic safety concerns that you may be experiencing in your community, such as uh, a new stop sign request, a traffic camera request, or uh, you know, sight distance issues, near misses and things of that nature. Um, the first step is with 311. You submit the request and you will receive a questionnaire from our customer service clearinghouse. Once you submit the um, traffic safety assessment, you will receive an acknowledgement letter. And the important portion that we ask is that you all engage your ANC by um, asking them for an endorsement letter or email. It can be as formal as a, a letter or just an email to uh, traffic safety to let us know that this is a larger community concern. Um, so yes, I encourage everyone to work with their ANC for that. I did want to provide my contact information for those of you who have uh, DDOT issues that you need to close the loop on or would like to talk about how to get it on our radar. My email is donise.jackson at dc.gov. My phone number is 202-391-8764. And thank you all for having me here today. I um, will share the presentation for those of you that need it. Thanks so much, Ms. Jackson. And if you wouldn't mind um, some of the links that you had in your presentation, as well as your contact information, if you could put those in the chat, that would okay. be really helpful, as well as a link to the survey. Yes, I'll put that in the chat as well. For Thanks so easy. much. Okay, I am happy to say that we are nine minutes ahead of schedule. Uh, and we've got some items on this list that will take a considerable amount of time, though I think the first couple will likely not. So I will, um, uh, Commissioner Simkowitz, I'm gonna um, pass this baton over to you and then ask that you keep likely the canal road erosion issue um, brief since I 
uh, wouldn't expect too much community comment on this one. Uh, Riley, uh, can you post the photograph? Uh, as many of you know, there's been multiple collapses of the cliff along Canal Road between Foxhall Road and the Key Bridge. Um, the picture that Riley, our clerk, is going to be placing on the screen uh, shows uh, how Canal Road's uh, westbound lane uh, toward the curb has been uh, taken up by uh, uh, preventive measures so people don't get hurt by additional debris falling. Uh, we've had at least two major cliff collapses in the past year. And, and as you can see, even after the, um, uh, the workers have cleaned up you know, the major cliff collapse, there's still stuff coming down the cliff. Um, uh, every, every week there's things like this that, that come up. Um, I prepared a resolution requesting that the DC Department of Transportation and the National Park Service work in a collaborative manner to find a permanent solution to the cliff collapses. And as part of that solution, work to complete the trolley trestle trail from Foxhall Road to Georgetown so that pedestrians and bicyclists can travel between the Palisades and Georgetown in a safe uh, manner and away from the busy thoroughfare street that Canal Road is. So um, uh, I ask uh, if uh, I'd like to introduce this as a resolution and I ask if there's a second. There's a second. 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 Uh, Commissioner Ela, do you want to open it up for uh, any questions or concerns? Yes. Um, any questions or concerns? And if none, we can proceed and to a vote. Then, um, and what I'd like to do for the vote is, Riley, can can we again do roll call for the vote? Thanks so much. Are you ready to vote? Okay. So we will start with um, uh, O one. Commissioner Alkins. Um, Madam Chairman, I think we have one person in the audience who has a oh, question. I'm so sorry, I did not. Thanks so much. Henry Lees. Um, there's a question from uh, Andrew Heimert. It says, if a lane of traffic is being closed temporarily, why isn't the sidewalk in the street with the contract protecting it? Um, I, don't, I don't really know. Uh, Riley, can you bring up the photograph again, please? One second. Uh, the, the, the answer to that is the sidewalk is in the street, uh, but the pedestrians walk on the traffic side of the concrete barrier. And the reason why, as you can see in this photograph, that there is debris that is falling on the regular sidewalk and that extends all the way up to that concrete barrier. So unfortunately, pedestrians uh, have to walk on the traffic side of the barrier. I hope that answers your question. Uh, yes, can sort I, of. I guess it seems pretty unsafe to have them protected only by cones, but I, I hopefully it can be fixed. Uh, note, note the two cones that are knocked over in the photograph. Yeah, and that, those cones that are knocked over uh, could very easily, as Mr. Heimer uh, uh, stated, could easily be a, a person. and. Um, I've walked on that um, and I can see that that, that is a, a definite concern. So that's one of the things that the Department of Transportation has to look at. Um, also JP, Commissioner JP, if I can add to that, this is Sonia in the Foxhall Village. Ms. Jackson, the cones, the way they are located right now do not meet the standard details of traffic control, MOT, safe driving and cones that any, any street should have. Uh, in particular, those cones should be located farther into the curve before the drivers come uh, into the cones on the right lane. As of now, that's unsafe and is not meeting the DDO re requirements. Thank you, Ms. Sonia. Um, and that, that's, that, that is a very uh, perceptive uh, comment. Uh, that's, you know, these cones are getting hit by cars every day. And, and uh, like I said before, in, in response to Mr. Heimert, um, the, uh, it, it very easily could be a person. And uh, also, as Ms. Sonia stated, uh, the, um, the uh, road should be closed a lot further back toward the key bridge because cars come up to this at a high rate of speed and sometimes they slam on their brakes when they realize they can't go any further. So thank you for that comment. Mr. B. Yeah, hi. I, I'm, yeah. Thanks. Uh, no, I just like to make 
the, the comment I'd like to make is that, uh, so this sidewalk has a lot of problems uh, over and above just the landslides. Uh, it's a very narrow sidewalk. Uh, the area southeast of where the landslides is occurring uh, has a couple of blind corners that are very dangerous. Some pedestrians could easily be uh, swiped. Uh, and um, there's one section where basically the, the already very narrow sidewalk, probably about four foot wide, is bisected by a pole and a, uh, and a wire, uh, which my son actually hit while he was biking down there. So, I mean, the point is that I, I, I just, you know, it's not that there's the landslides, but there needs to be a comprehensive solution here um, to, that would fix all of these issues in addition to the landslide. Um, and that comprehensive solution as I think JP has outlined, um, probably involves the rehabilitation of the trolley trestle. But beyond that, then a connection potentially to Prospect Street or an alternative connection uh, down to M Street um, so that the other issues with the sidewalk can be fixed as well. Uh, Mr. Beeth is 100% correct. And thank you, Mr. Beeth. The, um, if you have ever been a pedestrian on this sidewalk during the rain, you're going to see that you get wet because the drainage is so bad, you will 100% be sprayed. But that pole that Mr. Beeth is describing, which is very close to the Key Bridge uh, side of, the, of Canal Road, um, I don't know how anybody with a stroller or is in a wheelchair can get around that. It's, it's extremely narrow and it's extremely unsafe. So uh, as Mr. Beeth said, uh, you, we have to take a look at every uh, issue involving this, not just the collapse of the road, uh, of, the, of the cliff rather. Uh, Mr. Young, Brett Young. Yeah, hi, uh, I'll just my, make my comments to Denise. Um, I, a couple of weeks ago or about a week and a half ago, I sent an email to Everett Lai and uh, he referred me to Ellen Jones and Ellen Jones never got back to me. So, but the part of this letter that JP wrote on behalf of uh, ANC3D was regarding uh, the Foundry Branch Bridge and the right now at this time, DDOT uh, originally stated that they weren't gonna pursue the project, but things have changed because Mary Che and the DC council have put in a budget to acquire, it looks like it's good, they're gonna acquire the Georgetown Day School uh, MacArthur Boulevard campus, which I think, which runs right behind the trolley, the trolley trail runs right behind the school, um, saving this. And if, and if Georgetown residents are going to be going to this high school or middle school, it would be a good idea, I believe, for DDOT to revisit it and consider taking over this bridge, restoring it, and working out a way with the university or somehow connecting to Prospect Street. Um, that, as uh, some of the photos you indicate, the, the sidewalk, no matter what you do with the um, cones and the concrete barriers, it's still going to be a small sidewalk. And how are kids going to walk to school and ride to school with an ADA compliant path? And you, you could do that with the trolley path. And that's all I want to say. And I hope that Denise, you will go back to your director and somehow at least get Ellen Jones to give me an answer on this because she's ignored me for about a week and a half. But uh, really, DDOT really, really needs to revisit this now that uh, the, the, the district is going to acquire the school. Thank you. Uh, there's two heroes on the on this uh, call. One is Mr. Brett Young, who, uh, uh, Mr. Young, correct me if I'm wrong, on Christmas Day, you were the first person to spot the cliff collapse and you called it in, so it was closed? That's correct. I did it, yes. And, and yeah. thank you for that. And the second hero is Don East Jackson, who actually uh, helped out in the closure of this. So, you know, it definitely protected the public. So thank you to both of them. Uh, Mr. Wells had a question or a comment, uh, and his comment was, Another problem is that there is an adequate advance notice that the right lane is about to close. The closure is around a corner as one proceeds westbound and you have to slam on your brakes to avoid running into the concrete barriers. And that is exactly what Ms. Sonia testified to a few minutes ago that uh, you're, you're getting people coming at a high rate of speed uh, because that is a, a road that everybody knows people speed on and they don't know because they have a blind corner that the road is going to be closed and they literally slam on their brakes and I've seen numerous near misses on uh, at that point. Uh, is there any other public comment? Um, Commissioner, it's Ms. Jackson. Hi. Yes. So I did speak with um, our team today, Dowit, uh, I, I forget his last name, but he did a field assessment and we were trying to figure out if it was safe uh, to 
either open the lane or reconfigure um, how the uh, alert and road closure. Hello? I can hear you now. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So I spoke with our team today about Canal Road and um, we were trying to figure out because this is a primarily uh, NPS project, how we could either um, reopen the lane or um, reconfigure the, the sidewalk closure. So that is something that is on our agenda. Um, from the field visit that was done last Friday, the team observed that there are still uh, safety impacts. So I do not believe that we will be reopening the lane, but it, I am taking the feedback that I'm hearing today along with uh, you know, the concerns that we had for the location and see how we can um, either create sort of a sidewalk extension or uh, make it safer for advance notice for uh, the drivers using the roadway. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Anybody else? Any other comments? No. Uh, okay. Um, vote then. Shall we move to vote? I'm sorry. I do have a quick question or quick yeah. comment. Uh, my understanding, and this is in regard to the Foundry Branch trestle demolition inside the, um, the park between Georgetown and the Foxhall Village. My understanding is that it's not the dot, the one that is demolishing that trestle, but Wamara. That's correct. Okay. And how is that going? How is that third party or that party going to be engaged with the input from the community? Is someone from them attending these meetings? Uh, well, uh, unfortunately, there has been significant public meetings on that very issue. And uh, the uh, <laughs> effort culminated with the decision by the mayor's agent, which is a fancy name for uh, an independent person that, that heard evidence. And the, the mayor's agent uh, approved the demolition of the bridge. So I, I believe that the bridge is gonna come down and nothing's going to uh, be able to stop that. However, that doesn't mean a new bridge can't be built in its place or alternatively, a set of switchbacks can be utilized to, to safely get people from the top of the hill down into the valley and then back up again. Uh, but that's something that, that is going to have to be discussed at, at, a, um, at a level between the National Park Service and uh, DDOT uh, regarding the Trolley Trestle Trail, which is the whole purpose of my resolution that they engage on this very issue. Hi, can I make a comment? Uh, sure, Mr. Stebbins. Right, thanks, this is Sam Stebbins. Um, this is, I think, a message for Ms. Jackson mostly, which is we really need to see more adequate protection, you know, on the where it goes to one lane tomorrow. Okay, it's inherently unsafe. I almost got picked off there yesterday, and it, there's no reason it can't get something else out there tomorrow. It's just going to, it's an accident waiting to happen in so many ways, and it's going to be very easy to at least put more cones or something. So tomorrow would be a good day. Thank you. Thanks. Commissioner Ela. All right. Um, thanks to everyone for their comments on this. Uh, are there any revisions to the letter recommended? Honey, where's your boo-boo? Okay. Is there a motion? And then, uh, yeah, you know, I we already motion. have a motion. Yeah, actually. I already have the motion. We've got the motion in, so we're past this. Uh, let's go ahead and vote. Uh, shall we start with Riley, are you ready for roll call? Yeah. Uh, 3D01? Yes. 3D02? Yes. 3D03? Yes. 3D04? Aye. 3D05? Yes. 3D06? Yes. 3D07? Yes. 3D08? Yes. 3D09? Yes. 3D10? Yes. All right, um, you may ask consent. Why don't we move on to our next item on the agenda? And uh, this is back to Commissioner Elkins and his excellent letter as well as collaboration across the commission on Move DC 2020. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Chair. I, this is a letter that comments on a planning effort 
underway at the Department of Transportation uh, called Move um, DC 2021. Uh, it's a revision of a document done a few years ago. It's supposed to be a 20 to 25 year look out into the future in terms of uh, how we would like to see the transportation uh, system work and to lay some uh, uh, down some uh, strategies and goals for both the uh, near, near years as well as uh, the later years. Uh, the Transportation Committee has been working on this letter and uh, would have uh, produced this letter. We would like to uh, have it uh, reviewed and uh, approved tonight if, uh, if, it, if it's satisfactory. Uh, basically what the uh, trans what these, this letter calls for is uh, a few items. I'll mention just a few. One is that uh, we are disappointed that the uh, plan so far it seems to be um, uh, fairly short ranged, uh, looking more like a five or ten year plan. Uh, if you think about twenty five years from now, it's uh, the year twenty forty six. And that's awfully close to uh, 2050, which is the year that this uh, uh, city needs to be uh, as, as near to being uh, uh, carbon neutral as possible. Uh, how are we going to get there? Uh, we're not going to get there by just building a few more miles of bus lanes or a mile or two of, um, of special lanes for buses. There's going to have to be a lot more in there, and it's not in this plan. So we are asking them to expand their vision. Uh, to be bolder and to really lay out what's necessary. Um, we're, we're particularly identifying uh, for the Department of Transportation the fact that ANC 3D is at the juncture of um, uh, Virginia, Maryland, um, and uh, we are um, a territory across which uh, many commuters uh, need to pass in order to get to work in one of those jurisdictions, either coming or going home. And, um, and yet this plan really doesn't recognize that as a problem which is expected to grow if uh, Bethesda can, uh, grows the way it's uh, uh, expecting to. It's, it's becoming a major city on our border uh, with Marriott uh, uh, locating their, their, their headquarters there, et cetera. Um, so we're asking them to be much more aggressive in having a standing committee to uh, look at Maryland um, DC issues in particular. Um, they don't uh, do anything special about vehicles. You would think that vehicles are going out of uh, use uh, in this plan. I, I think we all would like to see fewer uh, vehicles, get people out of their vehicles, but um, uh, just think that there doesn't have to be any maintenance of the present system is not realistic. Uh, we think that their goals for pedestrian use are very um, shallow, uh, timid. Uh, we're suggesting that uh, all the um, sidewalks that meet the DDOT criteria with regard to priority, that is ones that go to transit stops, to schools, to parks, that they should be built in the next 10 years. Uh, some of the people, my colleagues on the Transportation Committee think 10 years is too, is too long. We're trying to give them a little bit of a uh, uh, leeway here. We think that they need to upgrade their uh, 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 repair of uh, sidewalks and do it as fast as they do potholes. We don't know why it takes so long uh, for sidewalk uh, trip, tripping hazards when they can do potholes in three days. Um, more on bicycles, more on transit, um, more collaboration with the community. Um, modernizing the traffic signal technology. Um, so it's quite a long letter. Uh, we think though that it um, is a, is a uh, should be helpful to uh, our colleagues at the Department of Transportation and will be uh, reasonably well received. And it does reflect, as was said earlier, a, a great deal of analysis by uh, our neighborhood um, members of the Transportation Committee and I appreciate uh, all of their efforts. So I would like to move that uh, this letter be uh, adopted by the commission um, and uh, see if there are any comments and see if there's a second. Second. Are there any comments? Madam Chairman. Thank you. Uh, just to take two seconds. Uh, 
Commissioner Elkins, I, I want to pass on, um, I think, the entire um, commission and probably the entire community's appreciation to the uh, to the Transportation Committee for this work. Uh, this is the uh, second excellent statement that we've um, taken up in uh, in as many months, and um, it's it's long, but it's comprehensive and it's it's uh, excellent. It strikes the right tone and, and touches on the the right issues. So uh, I commend uh, you and, and your colleagues on the committee for it. Thank you. Are there any other comments about this letter? I, I would only second what Michael uh, just said, Commissioner Security just said. Yeah, I, I, I would uh, third that and say, as I said in the chat, I think this illustrates how imagine if we could get a group of people together to put a robust letter like this on education issues, on parks, on senior issues. There's a whole range of things we can do when we get the best of the community together uh, to work on it. So thank you so much to the hardworking volunteers and Chuck Elkins, who has, with Derry Allen, led them very well. Well, I think we have been very pleasantly uh, surprised by the amount of effort that uh, members of the community are willing to put into this. Uh, this work and they are all very talented um, and I think it, it's really been great to see uh, how the community can pull together and, and produce products like this and we do have members of the community who are not members of the committee members of the committee but are members of the community who do attend our meetings and contribute so uh, it has been a very positive experience and I would commend it uh, for other possible uh, opportunities for the uh, for the commission. Uh, so are there any other, are there any amendments we, people would like to see in this letter? Otherwise, I would like to call for a vote. All right, let's call for a vote. Riley, are you ready again? Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Uh, 3D01? Yes. 3D02? Yes. 3D03? Yes. 3D04? Aye. 3D05? Yes. 3D06? Yes. 3D07? Yes. 3D08? Yes. 3D09? Yes. 3D10? Yes. It's unanimous. All right, unanimous. All right, thanks so much to the Transportation Committee, Derry, and uh, Commissioner Elkins, thanks so much. And I am sorry for the background noise. Uh, soon my kids will go to bed, I hope. <laughs> All right, moving on. Uh, we are going to move on in our list to um, a testimony that Commissioner Elkins would like to um, provide. And so I'm going to move this back over to Commissioner Elkins no. on uh, his outline for Mary no. Chase Roundtable. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mary Che is having a hearing on the 23rd of March uh, in which uh, she is, um, or it's a roundtable, uh, technically speaking, uh, which she's asking the community to advise her about post-pandemic uh, uh, transportation issues. She's named specifically issues such as slow streets and st streeteries. The streeteries are those places where restaurants uh, occupy part of a traffic lane in order to be able to accommodate their customers uh, outside uh, uh, their establishment. Um, slow streets being those where uh, signs are restrict people to 15 miles an hour and, and just local traffic, hopefully. Um, so um, we thought that uh, we would uh, be helpful to testify and with the help of one member in particular of the Transportation Committee, uh, Mark Blumenthal, we uh, did a survey in the listservs um, to see what members of our community think about uh, slow streets and streeteries, whether they like them now and whether they would like to have them continue after the pandemic, because that's one of the major questions um, a council member Mary J is asking. Um, and um, we had 129 people um, uh, respond, which I thought was a, a really a very good uh, response. Of course, it's not 
representative of the 20,000 people who live in our district, but it certainly shows that a lot of interest in this. And overall, the uh, response was favorable both uh, now and uh, going forward post uh, pandemic. However, um, we encouraged uh, individual comments from people and, and they of course did identify a number of issues with regard to uh, these uh, uh, situations such as uh, the idea that speed bumps might be better than the putting the sign at the end of the street, that the signage uh, is ugly and sometimes insufficient and sometimes dangerous, uh, that there's spillover into neighborhood streets, um, that um, uh, there's a, it generates a false uh, sense of security, and it also sets up um, in terms of competition between streets, uh, winners and losers. Um, um, and that for the streeteries that um, you do have to breathe a lot of uh, automobile fumes as you sit there heating, it does take away parking and uh, they don't look very neat. So it's not a, I, I've given you all the negative things so they're a very positive thing, I should say, very positive as you can imagine based on the vote that people like the, uh, the ability to walk and bike uh, more safely and like to be able to eat outside. So. Um, what I'd like to do, and I'm asking permission from the, um, from the commission to authorize me to testify on behalf of the commission at this hearing and to essentially give the results of the survey, which I think um, um, the uh, council member will find uh, useful. It's not just the opinion of one person, but at least the opinions of 129 people from our district. Um, but also at the same time, um, I would ask um, the commission to authorize me to address a couple of larger issues uh, with the thought that perhaps the council member might want to uh, hold hearings or otherwise investigate these issues with the Department of Transportation. And that is uh, just two issues uh, in particular. One is, as we come out of the pandemic, uh, will is it likely that people will be reluctant to um, uh, travel on transit? Uh, our buses and metro, et cetera. And uh, is there anything that could be done now to plan to try to make the transit more um, attractive to riders, particularly in terms of their feeling about uh, safety? So just as an example, is there anything they might want to do to the air handling on, uh, on transit in order to assure people that uh, it is uh, safe to try to travel that way and that they therefore do not have to get into their cars and, and uh, travel uh, to work or wherever. Uh, uh, rather than waiting for the pandemic to be over, it seems that uh, maybe this kind of planning could go ahead now. We don't need to wait to know that, that people are gonna be reluctant to travel on transit, I would suggest. And the second item is, will this change the way in which, um, what modes of travel people uh, choose um, automobiles, bicycles, or whatever. And are there some steps that the city could take now to ameliorate any adverse effects about this shift, possible shift in mode of travel? Um, um, to be frank, I think these are equally as important as streeteries and slow streets. And we would expect the city council and DDOT to, to be thinking ahead, and I'm sure they probably are, and this would just encourage them to to uh, do so uh, more aggressively. So uh, I do not have written testimony at this point, uh, but I'm asking uh, with this, this is sort of an outline that the commission uh, uh, authorized me to make these points um, in uh, eloquent testimony, I'm sure. <laughs> so that's my motion to uh, give me a license to testify on behalf of the commission. Do we have a second? I would second that. All right, thanks Andrew, so much. Andrew, do you have to make comment? Thanks. Can we get me started? Yeah, no, Chuck, I, I just wanted to um, put forth one further issue that uh, I at least would like to, to, to see you mention, and I'm, I'm sure there are others as well, uh, which is not, not just slow streets, but, but fast streets. Um, we know we have data that during the pandemic speeds have increased, um, that the rate of accidents per vehicle have increased, uh, that injuries per vehicle have increased. Um, and it's not clear that the 
that DDOT's current strategy for speed mitigation, which relies upon static speed cameras, is really effective. I mean, the 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 anecdotes that were provided earlier um, uh, when, uh, in response to to the MPD uh, report uh, suggest that they're not. You know, cars slow down in the vicinity of the speed camera, which they know, and then they speed up immediately after. So I would th that would be an issue that I would certainly like to see raised, um, and I, 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 there may be others as well that may be interested in that. If you would consider that, I, I would be willing to do that if, if uh, unless there's an objection from the commission. So I would take that. As, uh, could I suggest that as an amendment to my outline and then uh, put that forward to the commission? So I guess, uh, Madam Chairman, I guess the question is, are we ready for a, a vote? Or? It sounds like we're ready for a vote. And so the friendly admit amendment from Andrew is included in this outline and uh, Riley, would you like to yeah, kick off this vote? You're making out. I can as well. Uh, why don't we start with uh, 3D01? Yes. 3D02. Okay. Um, yes. 3D03. Yes. 3D04. Abstain. 3D05. I'll have to submit it. I have a piece of wool. 3D05. I found somewhere. All right, we're going to move on to 3D06. Yes. 3D07. Yes. 3D08. Yes. 3D09. Yes. 3D10. Yes. Okay. So we had two of. Uh, of <laughs> and eight. Yes. All right, we will move on to here from here to the yeah, high school saying, resolution. Saying, you know what that means? I am very sorry you know about this means? background noise. Um, I blame my husband. Uh, but I will <laughs> move it over <laughs> to uh, JP. We don't have the same problem. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Ela. Um, the District of Columbia Public Schools is in the process of formulating a plan to address overcrowding and other issues that impact Ward 3 public school students. In addressing these issues, the District of Columbia Public Schools has presented several options that are currently under consideration, such as the purchase of the old Georgetown Day School site located on MacArthur Boulevard, which ANC 3D um, gave its blessing to last month. Um, and the construction of a new building on both the site of the current old Hardy building that is currently leased to the lab school. And that building will extend into the, the adjacent Hardy Park, whether the soccer fields or the tennis court area. They haven't decided which area, but it will take up a significant part of Hardy Park. Unfortunately, it appears that some decisions have been made by our government um, with little to no opportunity for public comment and with little to know consideration of issues important to the community at large, such as traffic, transportation, the need for parks, the need for recreation centers, and the need to use public buildings for public purposes. One particular decision that is troubling is the lease of the old Hardy building to the lab school. That lease expires in 2023 and is uh, currently uh, planned for renewal. And that, that renewal will be a long time, uh, 20 years, 30 years. We, we don't know the details, unfortunately. An email from the District of Columbia Public Schools uh, to uh, some members of the community uh, dated February 19th, 2021 stated, we wanted to follow up to what many of you shared about the old Hardy site. In the meeting, we heard an interest from the group's DC potential, uh, DCPS's potential use of the old Hardy site and a push to reconsider having the building itself to be, quote, on the table, end quote, as part of this process. We want to reiterate that the building is not under consideration as it is leased to the lab school and therefore not within DCPS's planning scope to consider as part of this planning process. Our understanding remains that this decision is final and we do not anticipate this changing, end quote. 
the fact that this decision is, quote, final should offend each and every taxpayer in the District of Columbia, as your government has not presented any information to the public as to the options, benefits, detriments, or alternatives to the lease of the old Hardy building to the lab school. In addition to not providing the public with any of the bases for such a decision, your government also failed to give taxpayers the opportunity to provide public comment before this monumental decision was made. Again, a decision to construct a building on a public park and a building that will be around a lot longer than I'll be alive, unfortunately. First of all, uh, I'd like to say at the outset that the Georgetown Day School site, which we have given our blessing to, and the Old Hardy site, both the park and the Old Hardy building, are located within my single member district. Second, uh, I'd like to uh, remind the commissioners that we are advisory, advisory, advisory neighborhood commissioners. And it is our job to receive information from the government on matters of public interest. Then it is our, it is our duty to ascertain our constituents' opinions about that matter. Once we receive the neighbors' opinions, it then becomes our duty to present these opinions to the government for the executive branch or the council to make a final decision. We as advisory neighborhood commissioners are derelict in our duty if we permit the government to short circuit the vital process of providing information to the public sufficient to permit the public to formulate opinions on matters of public interest. What matter could be of greater public interest than the construction of two public buildings, the lease of another public building and the destruction of a public park. Again, these buildings will last longer than any of us will be alive and the lease of the public building, uh, which is the old Hardy building, will bind the government for at least 20 years. What do we know about the government's plans? Nothing. The government failed to answer when we asked two years ago uh, at, at our ANC meeting in March of 2019, when we had an extensive debate on this issue, uh, the government failed to answer the, the following questions, uh, one of which uh, we just came up, which is the cost of renovating the Georgetown Day School. But the others, what is the benefit that the government will receive from the rental of the old Hardy building? What's the rent? What are the terms? We have no idea. What's the cost of constructing a new Foxhall Village School? Again, we have no idea. What is the basis for the taking of the Hardy Park land especially when the Hardy Park land is in the midst of a multi-million dollar renovation with construction tr trucks currently on the property. These renovations will be destroyed by the taking of the land for a school building, obviously. Uh, another issue that has not been addressed uh, and made public is what is the expected traffic impact of the government's plan for three schools in a two block radius, especially considering that the D6 bus line will no longer be operating. Uh, and finally, has the government considered any other locations for public schools within ANC 3D's boundaries, such as Turtle Park? Uh, and if not, why not? My very simple uh, resolution that I placed on the website uh, is aimed at requiring the city, your government, to adhere to its normal process of obtaining community comment before making an important public decision. I don't know what the final answer is gonna be. My resolution doesn't tell the city to keep lab school at Old, old Hardy or alternatively to kick them out. Um, maybe the answer is to have two schools, lab and the, and the new Foxhall Village Elementary School on the same Hardy Park site, maybe not. But that's not what my resolution is, is geared toward. Uh, toward my resolution is geared toward giving the, the public the opportunity to present their comment after receiving all of the information from the city, and that has not been done. The bottom line is that we as ANC commissioners are derelict in our duty if we accept as a quote done deal a new lease of the old Hardy building to the lab school and the construction of a new school in the Hardy Park land without any, any information given to the public about the benefits, costs, alternatives, and expected impacts of the proposed plan and without any opportunity for the public to provide comment. If we accept this as a quote done deal, I guarantee that our constituents will not be happy. Look at the Jella Field renewal uh, of the lease to the private school and how much public opposition that that uh, entailed. Uh, I want to bring everybody back to the Hardy Park for a second. 
uh, an example of how the city properly engaged with the community was when the Department of Parks and Recreations engaged with your neighbors, my neighbors, and me uh, with the community for over two years with regard to their multi-million dollar renovation to Hardy Park. These renovations will be wasted if a new school is built on that park uh, uh, by, for the old Hardy uh, School. This DPR and community engagement consisted of numerous in-person meetings that were well attended by community members. These meetings first allowed the public to share their quote, want list for things to go in this renovated park, like walking trails, a dog park and playground equipment accessible for mobility challenged youngsters. At every single meeting, the architects came back in the very next meeting with updated plans that factored in the suggestions provided by the community at the prior meeting. By the end of the process, I believe that the community received an excellent park renovation plan that had 100% or close to it support of the surrounding community. This is exactly the kind of process that should be followed with regard to the school's debate here, which is not really a debate, unfortunately at all, but rather a fait accompli. Again, shame on the city for forcing a plan on the community without any community input and without presenting the community the cost benefits and alternatives. And shame on any commissioner that votes for the charade. I have to remind my fellow commissioners that ANC Path 3D passed a resolution in March 2019 on the extension of the old Hardy lease to the lab school. And this direction, which was directed to the council stated, quote, please help our neighborhoods by demanding exploration of whether and how old Hardy might fit into a solution to the larger overcrowding situation in Ward 3. This should happen as part of a straightforward process that is already in place to handle such issues such as the proposed lease extension, end quote. Our March 2019 resolution also stated that the emergency legislation that sought to extend the lease of Old Hardy to the lab school, quote, swings a giant wrecking ball at public safeguards. There is time for the council to hear directly from our constituents and other residents of Ward 3. When government repeatedly carves out benefits for a single entity at the exclusion of input from other stakeholders, public skepticism is well-founded. District residents have been denied an official platform to discuss the old Hardy site since 2013, and the district has never gone on record to respond. Please allow for citizen participation concerning the site's future as provided for under existing district law. And that is exactly what I'm asking for here. For, the, for ANC3D to do the same thing that we did two years ago. Nothing more, nothing less. Again, I'm not saying get rid of lab school. I'm not saying keep lab school. I'm not saying uh, don't build on Hardy Park. I'm not saying build on Hardy Park. All I'm asking for is for the process to work. Why did the ANC3D demand accountability from the government two years ago with regard to old Hardy and today act like sheep? blindly and unquestionably following the government. It is likely that I'm going to lose on my resolution today, which point, concerns, point of order, point of order. concerns I don't think the should, process. Point of order. I have the order. floor, uh, Commissioner Bergman. No, no, point, I have a point of order, and I think the parliamentarian would agree that I'm allowed to state my point of order. You should not be uh, stating uh, derisive comments about fellow commissioners. It's inappropriate. It's not allowed under the rules. Uh, no. I, would ask you, I would ask you to desist. My resolution concerns the process rather than the outcome, but at least I will be able to tell my constituents that I gave it my best shot and will rest soundly knowing that, that I did everything that I could uh, to protect my constituents from the tyranny of a government that is imposing its decisions upon the public without presenting the basis for the plan and without allowing the public to comment about these plans before the decision is final. All right, thank you, JP. Are you finished? I am. Uh, okay. I, I suggest that we open it up to public comment. Uh, yeah, and before we do, um, here, here's how I like to do this. As I said at the beginning of the call, uh, I'd like to give those who do wanna talk, and we have three hands raised right now, um, uh, two to three minutes a piece. And the idea here is for 15 minutes of public comment before moving to commission comment. So. Uh, with that, I'm going to open it up uh, to uh, Mr. Wolf, who was the first to raise his hand. And here, Mr. Wolf, I will um, un 
I think you're unmuted now. Thank you, uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'd like to congratulate uh, Commissioner Simkowitz for an excellent letter. Um, my name's Tom Wolf. I have lived on Q Street across from the tennis courts for 39 years. And uh, uh, I look at uh, the Hardy Green Space as our uh, uh, village green, uh, similar to the way New England has its village greens. Uh, we gather there to uh, picnic. We have community park uh, uh, gardening there. Um, we uh, coach. So I coach soccer there for a number of years on the on that uh, soccer field. Um, and uh, we, our kids shoot baskets there. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a quality of life issue for the people of Q Street, Q Lane, Q Place. Um, we are very concerned that the district is moving ahead with something without soliciting any of our input uh, as to uh, the uh, use of the property. And if you look at the uh, um, map that, was accomp that accompanied the uh, 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 presentation that uh, uh, Commissioner Simkowitz uh, 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 posted today, you can see that uh, any new school is going to take a significant footprint of the uh, remaining property and do away with it. So this is going to be a major impact on our neighborhood. Uh, if anyone has traveled down Q Street at uh, two or three in the afternoon when the uh, uh, lab school is uh, diverting traffic, uh, for pickup and, and drop off, you, I can't even get into my driveway. So adding 500 children, I love children, but 500 more um, with uh, parents in uh, SUVs picking them up every day is going to make life hell around here. So that's my point. Um, I would just ask that uh, perhaps the Q Street, Q Place, Q Lane neighbors get an opportunity to meet on site with uh, Councilwoman Shea and have her tell us that uh, we need to sacrifice this quality of life uh, in order to, uh, to uh, bring a new school online. There must be other places to put this school, but I'd be willing to listen to, uh, to whatever she has to say. Thank you. All right, thanks so much. Um, for those who agree with Mr. Wolf, would you please um, uh, either applaud or add something to your your um, reaction so that I understand and the rest of the community understands who's in agreement. Okay, thanks so much. Um, Ms. Duncan, uh, would you like to go next? I'm trying to unmute you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ella. Um, so I would like everyone to know that DCPS has convened a community working group that includes many, many of the community leaders who have been invested in dealing with overcrowding in this, uh, in the Ward 3 feeder pattern for quite some time. It includes members of the Fox Hall uh, Community Citizens Association, the FCCA, um, and it includes people from every elementary school and other community leaders. And the idea of the community working group that DCPS has convened is to come up with ideas to address overcrowding while keeping in mind equity for the Old Hardy site and the GDS site. After the community working group has convened, any proposal that is put forward, and I imagine there's going to be more than one choice, is going to be put forth to the community for comment. So I am having a hard time understanding why there's this idea of transparency and this, that, and the other. I would like everyone on this call to understand that Overcrowding in DC public schools is a real issue in Ward 3. The schools are successful, the schools are popular, people want to send their kids to these schools. Change is coming and we need to accept the change and, and figure out a way of the change that benefits the most people. If you are talking about 
traffic at your school and whatever, whatever, just go over to key school during drop off and, and pick up before the pandemic. And you will see a functioning uh, neighborhood where the, the, the neighbors benefit from a, a, a fantastic public school in their neighborhood while dealing literally with 15 minutes of traffic in the morning and the afternoon. And I would also like to um, just, just say that there were there have been people in this community who, who uh, is my time up? All right, my time is up. Go on to the next person. Thank you. All right. Um, and I would also like to see those in the audience, if you're in agreement, um, please, please do raise your hand. And with that, I think, um, Vipul, I think you were uh, soon thereafter on the raise hand list. So here, I am going to ask to, for you to unmute. I'm hoping it's coming through. We still can't hear you. Oh, technology. Okay, uh, sorry, I think I, I just unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes. So thank you, Commissioner Ella. Um, and and uh, I, I, I just wanna say a couple of things. One is that um, um, I, I've just noticed as I scroll through the uh, list of folks on this call, I am stunned at the number of FCCA board members that are actually on this call. Uh, I think we have uh, probably a super majority of the entire board on this call, uh, even in the board. And I'm, by the way, I'm a Fox Hall Village resident and I'm also an FCCA board member, I have not seen a turnout like this even on the board meetings that we have uh, on a normal basis. So I think you should, <clears throat> you should take that as an indication of the strong interest that the FCCA board and the Foxhall Village community has in this issue. Uh, and um, uh, without getting into specifics on, on the issue uh, uh, at this moment, I think JP had put this very eloquently earlier, uh, but I think we are all actually quite stunned at how little uh, public interaction and reaction there has been that has come from the Foxhall Village community. Let us not forget that this is the community which is a historic district designated by the Historic Board as a historic district that is going to be affected the most by any decision that is made by uh, DCPS on where the school should be and how the school should be sized. Uh, I have a daughter who has, was a graduate of Georgetown Day School, actually. She was at the lower middle school right on that site. Um, I also have uh, uh, experience, and I was a resident before uh, for a while at Wesley Heights, so I know all, of, all the issues on Horace Mann and Key School and various other schools in the, in the area. And I'm actually quite stunned at the notion that the elementary schools and the parent-teacher uh, uh, organizations of other schools outside of this community are so vociferously advocating for this large mega school to be built in a neighborhood not of their choosing. Uh, why would they want to put a school in, in a neighborhood where uh, they're not being affected by all the issues that JP very eloquently laid out? So while I'm all for making sure that we have equitable uh, and, 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 and open access for elementary, middle school, and high school public education, for the residents, residents of DC, to me, it's a laughable proposition that the folks who are affected the most are not even being consulted. So I will stop there and pause and thank you for the time. Thanks so much. Um, let's see, I, I think um, Bob Avery, you had your hand raised. Here. Um, thank you, I'm not gonna echo, I'm the president of the FCCA uh, I'm not going to echo what other people have said. This is a monstrous, this is the largest elementary school being proposed in the lower Ward 3. It's bigger than any of the existing uh, schools. It's going to take over the park. Um, it's at the intersection of the three major thoroughfares that feed out of Ward 3. Every single person on this screen will have a longer commute as a result if there is a school put at Fox Hall. There are seven private schools within a half a mile of this. There's an inference that this, um, many of the speakers have, or several speakers have made, that somehow we're anti-education 
in Foxhall Village. There are seven private schools. There are two universities. There are two major embassies. There's a hospital all within one of this institution. We have more students here than any of the other ANC people. I was on the uh, committee that redistricted, uh, did the redistricting for all 10 of you in uh, the last uh, uh, census. One of the concerns about the size of ANC 3D, 10 people, that's a very large ANC. And the concern was that you're going to get NIMBY. You're going to get people voting on things that are not in their backyard and they don't care about. And that's not good community. That's divisive. It tears community apart. If this proposal was being proposed for Palisades, which is a much bigger, that's in fact the more appropriate one, you would all be up in arms. Because it's in Foxhall Village, you should care just as much. That's your job as ANC commissioners. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Janet, I think your hand was raised for quite a while. Thank you. Um, well, JP, Tom Wolf and, Wolf and Bob Avery made some of my points. Um, I actually live right next to Hardy Field on Foxhall Road. Uh, my family has been in this house since the um, early 1950s before I was born. Um, I went to kindergarten at Hardy School. Um, yeah, I think a very important point is the renovations that are undergoing right now after a delay of over a year. Um, but also, you know, besides the traffic uh, for pickup and drop off is the issue of where will additional student, additional staff members park. You know, there's a limited amount of parking place at the school as it is. Uh, if you add another school, where would they park or would you be paving over even more land? Um, especially since I've just learned that there's talk of discontinuing the D6, that makes everything much worse. Um, and I'll reiterate what Bob said about the number of schools within a half mile radius. I remember when the field school was coming, you know, there was so much discussion about the traffic and you know there are already so many schools and now we're talking about beyond what's here now adding putting gds back into the mix and adding another one thank you great right, thanks so much um paul and chris i will get to you next okay can you, can you hear me now yes yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thank you. Thanks to the commission for uh, uh, hearing us uh, tonight. First, I would obviously um, I want to reiterate some of the uh, the comments my the previous folks from the FCC have made, um, but I'd like to also make a number of new comments. Um, when when I look at this issue, and it's been talked about somewhat in this you know over the past couple of years, it, what strikes me most is how this pro this project which has happened in relative secrecy, at least in relationship to the community that is most impact, impacted, my community where I've lived for 20 years, where my wife and I raised our daughter who is now 23, uh, where she attended local schools. But what, has, what really concerns me is how this has morphed. What started out as the Keep Hardy Public Movement, which was our understanding was a, a, uh, a push to turn the old Hardy building from a private elementary school into a public elementary school, that was not particularly controversial. It really wasn't gonna have much impact on the neighborhood. That again happened without, with virtually no input from our local community. Uh, that then morphed into a, an expansion of, a, of, of an addition of a new school, destroying much of our park, to what extent we really don't know. And again, did not involve the community most impacted. And suddenly there was a, pl a plan to keep the lab school and also to add another elementary school uh, on the same site, which in and of itself struck me as a odd proposal to say the least, two schools side by side, one private, one public, destroying a park. Now there has been an additional, the project has morphed into a half a block away, the city is buying the GDS site and creating yet a, a, a what, what sounds to be like a third school. 
And the numbers have gone from 200 students to 400 students to now 800 students between the two schools. And all of this has happened with virtually no input from the local community. And this is, I, to say it's shocking, I mean, I, Vipple used the word stunning. I've been in this community for 20 years. I'm a lifetime Washington, D.C. resident. Virtually every issue has been discussed in great detail um, you know, by the FCCA. It's been, part of a, it's been part of this community. It's almost like it's in our blood that when something happens, it gets discussed. And yet one of the largest projects in, certainly in the 20 years since I've been here, has happened in virtual total secrecy. And I do just want to get, I hate to, to point out someone by name, but Ms. Duncan spoke about the, the quote unquote working group. The working group, which she's referring to, is a group which, to my understanding, includes one resident, one resident from the local community. All of the other members of the working group live outside of our community. I don't believe any other community would support this or would tolerate this to be treated in this manner. And again, our, our concern is the process. I'm not anti-education. And I just wanna just wrap up by saying, we need to stop this process, restart it and involve the people who are impacted. And they are the people who live in this immediate community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clarkson. Let's see. Hi, Paige, can you hear me? Yes. Great, thanks. Um, <laughs> I, I think I just would like to talk about um, the community involvement and the claims that the community and the FCCA have not been involved and have had no notice. <laughs> That's pretty incredible. Um, in July of 2020, I posted this in the chat, um, the FCCA newsletter had a headline above the fold article uh, titled Old Hardy Southside Eyed for 80,000 Square Foot Elementary Building and had an article about the proposal, which was introduced in May of 2020, was discussed in detail at the DC Council hearing on the budget. And I uh, dropped a link to that budget report which discusses the proposal and community testimony in detail. Um, also in the July 2020 FCA newsletter, they solicit uh, local input from for community members to participate in the SIT committee. So to claim that there's been no notice, no opportunity for public input, is just is mind boggling to me. Uh, and I just, you know, let's argue this on the merits. Let's, let's stick to the facts. Let's recognize that there's a public record that needs, that, that, that you have to refer to. There's a reason for a public record. There are a lot of very smart, highly educated people on this call. And it, it's just mind boggling that people would, would completely disregard what their own, their own community members have said what their own organizations have said and done. Um, so I just hope we can stick to the facts and people can uh, you know, remain cognizant of the record and, and the facts and what has been said and done and the representations made in the past. Thank you. When it was one school. All right, Chris, I'm sorry, here you go. So, um... I would just like to say to Will that um, one headline in the beginning of a pandemic um, doesn't, doesn't actually mean that everybody heard that and that everybody felt that that was an opportunity for public comment. Um, I live across the street from um, the rec center um, and I just want to reiterate a lot of what other people have said. There are gonna be significant transportation issues. There are gonna be significant parking impacts. It's gonna be a taking of green space it's going to be a removal of either a soccer field or tennis courts, both of which are extremely scarce in Ward 3. And um, we already have two, two schools that have been in operation in our one block uh, stretch of Q Street or two blocks for many years. That has had significant impacts, but adding another 500 person school on top of that is really putting us over the edge, uh, you know, just 
as others have said, there's an, an, there's an enormous amount of education happening in extremely small radius in this area, and it's not sustainable. Um, what all we're asking for is basic good government. We're just looking for public comment. We're just looking for democracy as everyone expects it to be in action. And we're looking for the city to not be making plans on the fly that they're not communicating with the, the um, communities that will be most impacted from it. And so I, 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 I strongly support Commissioner Simkowitz's letter. And I think that there's ample support on this call to pass his resolution and have that letter go to the chancellor. Thank you, Chris. Um, all right, so we are at the, we started this comment period at 9.06, we're at 9.27, um, which means instead of 15 minutes of comment, we did uh, 20, over 20 minutes of comment, but I also see that I've got one, two, three, four, five, six hands raised. Can we uh, limit all additional comments to one minute and we're not gonna be able to get to everyone. I am very sorry, um, but we can't get to everyone. Um, so Stuart, your hand has been raised for a while. Um, there you go. Thanks so much. I really appreciate everybody uh, bringing up these great points and the opportunity to discuss this and learn about it. This was a surprise to, to my wife and I. We live around the block from the park uh, and we like schools and we like parks. And our family with school age kids uh, could benefit from uh, a number of ways this might go. Uh, but you know, that said, I think balancing school with community life is incredibly important as others have, have noted. And um, you know, the first thing that jumps out at my wife and I, when we heard about this today for the first time about this three schools and two blocks um, possibility was uh, with the park. It's, it's hard to understand how uh, DC would justify a multi-million dollar renovation project for the park and then turn around and tear it down or pave over it for a new school. Again, I'd, I'd remain open-minded and my wife would, would too, but this is a lot of uh, change um, and, and very fast. A lot of us are just learning about this and we'd love to have an opportunity, as others said, to have public comment and more information before proposals are pitched. Thanks, thanks very much. I believe you're muted, Paige. You're on mute. Paige, you're on mute. Sorry, there we go. All right. So. Um, there are five remaining people with their hands raised. We're going to need to do this in about five minutes. Um, no more hand raises on this one. And we're just going to start from the left. Reem, are you ready to speak? Yes, thank you. I, I won't take up too much time. There's been a lot of conversation about who was provided notice and who's in the working groups. And I just wanted to provide some color. This is my son. He's 14. I wanted everyone to take a step back and stop talking about the bureaucracy. I want to know if there has been, first of all, I live at 1522. So I am at the house right next door to Janet. So our two houses along with 1516 and the one around from 1516 are the houses that are gonna be most impacted by this. And I wanna know if there's been an impact assessment done. There are comments that Key School is just as busy as Fox Hall, which is a farce. Fox Hall is already extremely busy. There's already a lot of traffic. My kids play in the front yard. My neighbor's four-year-old girl rides her bike in the front yard. Every day at three o'clock, there's gonna be a carpool line and people stepping on our yard. My only comment, and I'm trying to keep this under 30 seconds is, has there been an impact assessment done? That's it. Commissioner Ela, I just want to point out that Troy Kravitz has been raising his hand for some time, but oh. he can't get the he can't get the actual virtual button to work. So he's been raising it. Oh, I'm I sorry. <laughs> okay, we're gonna start with this top line, and then uh, Troy, if if it's okay, we'll do you last. Uh, Rick, I'm gonna go um, to you right now, and we're keeping this to a minute. Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, I've been in the Foxhall area on Q Street and I'll stick to the, you know, a few points. I just think personally we need to slow down, be a little more thoughtful about this. 
Um, I mean, a school's four years away from being built anyways. So what's another six to eight months? Um, I think we need to know what the impacts of the pandemic are. People have moved out of the city. I think a lot of people have switched schools to private schools, may not come back. Um, let's see what, what the impacts of the past year have on the community. And then I can't even think, I can't even imagine how kids would get to school on time. I used to live on MacArthur Boulevard and the traffic would back up all the way to the reservoir. So if you're dropping a child off at the school, how are you going to do that on time, right? I mean, I just think there's so many things that need to be thought through here and it doesn't hurt to slow down. It's going to take four years to build a school anyways. And the last point that I would make um, is we haven't even talked about the Georgetown Day School. Why don't we start with that and put kids in that school first and see how things go and take it one step at a time and then look at tearing down green space or building a school on top of another school. So I think that's something that a point that hasn't been hit on is we have this other facility, let's use it and, and so put it much. out there and then see what happens. Thank you Thanks. so much. All right, we're gonna move on to Caroline. Yes, hi. Um, so I'm going to be very brief. I just want to echo my, um, my neighbors. And I know that um, 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 it's our concern, the, this, this should take uh, into, uh, into account our concerns about the traffic, about, um, I mean, I have to go to, to, to work. And like the, uh, my neighbor before just highlighted, already before COVID, it was taking a long time on, on MacArthur Boulevard to just get out of, uh, um, to get to work. So traffic would be a big concern. And I don't see, um, I'm sure there's all the places where DC can put a school, but although I am open to options, I think that this should include us in the discussion. So that would be it for me. Thank you so much. All right, we're gonna move to Andrew. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, very quickly. Uh, so I have three uh, kids who are either in, in elementary school or will be in the coming years. Um, one of those kids is currently in a trailer. So I, I mean, it, there is no, uh, should be no controversy about the fact that, key, that Ward 3 desperately needs more public schools. Um, but, you know, look, I mean, I, I think this has become a divisive issue and I don't, I don't understand it because there should be one point that it should be uncontroversial and which I believe what we should focus on. And that is that the lab school lease of the old Hardy building should not be extended. And that should go through a transparent process. However, I mean, I would like to think that that point would be uncontroversial, but I remember a few years ago, a very heated meeting about the F FCCA when they had advanced a resolution asking for that very lease to be extended. And one of the justifications put up in favor of extending that lease was that this would be potentially turned into a public high school. So, I mean, is this about the substitution of private schools for public schools, or is this about transparency? If it's about transparency, then I'm all on board. If it's about keeping private schools in Ward 3 while public school children have to go on trailers, then of course I'm not. So I just think we should be very, very clear about what the issues are here. Thank you so much. Um, Taylor, if you're ready. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, I'll go ahead. Uh, first of all, thank you for everyone. It's good to see a lot of neighbors uh, on the call here. Um, we have a, a two-year-old and a four-year-old, and so four years from now, we actually would benefit from this, and we're in walking distance. We're very much in favor of seeing more schools, and we rec very much recognize the problem with Ward 3 and the overcrowding, and we don't want our kids to go to schools and trailers, and so all the benefits of it, we see it. But we do seem, it does seem to be sort of odd that I see, you know, Maryland plates and Virginia plates dropping off at the lab school every morning, adding to traffic you know, with the private school of non-DC residents as well when you know, it seems like there'd be a pretty obvious solution here to have a party be a public school. It seems to solve a lot of issues. Um, and I just have to think the economics are incredibly uh, favored towards uh, repurposing that school versus building a new one. Uh, I would love to find a place to maybe build another school. As far as the, the notice period, I don't know. I, we've lived on the street for seven years and I don't know all this. I mean, I've, I've learned, I saw the article last summer in the FCCA newsletter, but I thought it was in the parking lot. I didn't realize it was taking the and we talk at the park with a lot of people that are on this call. We're always sort of speculating where, where would it go? When would it go? What school is it? A middle school over there? Is it, it, it has been very confusing and sort of hard to follow. And I'm trying to dial in here. I've been to, you know, I don't know how many community meetings for the park that was coming in. 
So we're engaged now. You can see the, res res the response from the community now. We are engaged. I think we would like to, would like to learn more and hopefully can find a practical solution that sort of satisfies a lot of stakeholders here. Thank you, Taylor. Okay, um, we have one uh, more person to speak and then we're gonna move it over to commissioner comments. And because this is a former commissioner, I am going to give Troy the three minutes that I gave. Um, That's, I'll be quick. I, I, I'll start by taking a breath and lamenting the state of our society. Um, one of the more pernicious aspects of modern life is that people think they can act with impunity without ever having to own an iota of their blatant hypocrisy. I find the stance of those in the Foxhall Community Citizens Association disgusting. We hear that this proposal for, for, for two schools came out of nowhere, but of course that's not the case. Just read the FCCA newsletter. We hear that there was no community engagement. Again, the FCC newsletter, the FCCA newsletter invited community members to advise the mayor. We heard in previous meetings about the city not having an interest in the building currently leased to lab. Once again, left unsaid is that the FCCA worked behind the scenes, to have this building deemed historic, thereby making it less attractive for the return of a public school, a decision that was lauded and welcomed by the FCCA. And now when we listen to JP express concern about the lease terms for lab, there's no mention that the FCCA sent a letter to the mayor lauding lab as a good neighbor or that the FCA, FCCA declined to join the campaign raising concern about the lab lease two years ago, or that JP voted against the ANC joining the Keep Old Hardy public campaign. And JP, by the way, Turtle Park is in 3E, not ANC 3D, but we need more than just two schools. I personally would welcome one there at Turtle Park too. I don't view schools as threats, but rather community assets. To what end? Why these contortions? Let's listen to the FCCA president on why they like lab from March, 2019. Quote, we have a very low impact usage of that school right now in terms of community, negative impact. I don't get any complaints about it and there's no traffic, end quote. These same people then claim that they're the most impacted, them. Not the students going to school in trailers on a playground, them. Not the students who don't have enough time to eat lunch because there are too many students in the cafeteria, them, not the students that no longer have a gymnasium. They're the most impacted my rear end. The ANC should not be part and parcel to this travesty by sending any letter to the city built upon these falsehoods. You're better than this, each and every one of you, including JP. If you look at the argumentation, you see what this is about. This is about maintaining a low impact, no traffic use of that site, everyone else be damned. You can see the argumentation. There's no engagement with the fact that there are 2,000 seat deficit now in Ward 3, that there was a community group for years recommending multiple new schools are needed. None of that's mentioned. That's all you need to know. All right, thank you to everyone for their comments. All comments are um, valued. Now I'm gonna move it on to a commissioner discussion. Um, or I can move um, straight to see if we have a second. Um, ben. Discussion. Yeah, I, well, I, I defer if the other commissioners want to jump in, but I there are some slides that I'd like to just briefly present that I think would be illuminating um, for this discussion. Um, Riley, if you could just share those. If you go to the next the next slide or the, the, the slide over that. So this I think is, is very relevant for folks to, to look at this data. This shows um, the deficit that we currently have uh, for elementary school students in the Wilson feeder pattern and the projected deficit that will come uh, in year 28, 2028 and 2029, uh, 1300 elementary seats. Uh, Fox Hall Elementary, the, proposed, the proposal uh, would not, would not, this is to echo, uh, Troy's point, solve this issue, it would not eliminate the deficit, it would put a dent in it. And if you could just show the, the next um, page, Riley, because I think there were, there's a suggestion that we, we could do with only one um, new school, uh, and this shows the deficit at the secondary level in the Wilson feeder pattern. I think, um, I think these numbers are important, they speak for themselves, um, they illustrate the need um, for, for why um, this, the school, these two schools 
um, are being um, pushed by uh, the district government. And I just wanna highlight something that I think is important for people in, in this part of town to understand. This is a politically delicate situation. It is, there's not, there is political downside for the mayor and the council making a tremendous investment in Ward 3 public schools and the wealthiest ward in the, in the city, especially given recent headlines about Ward 3 parents forcing schools open while Ward 8 parents don't. There's, there are political dynamics at play that can be upended very easily. Um, I think that's, that's, a, that's a very important point that needs people need to be aware of. And this letter, uh, which seeks to, uh, for transparency, is a grenade that will be that will land and could potentially derail things. And that is the really problematic aspect. Some of these concerns about traffic, it's going to be considered. This is a big project. They're not going to. There's going to be consideration of how the kids do drop off in a in a two school site situation. There's going to be a long process to design a school, uh, a new school, a new Fox Hall school. But this, what we're seeing here is a classic NIMBY playbook. I think it needs to be called out. It's used in many contexts. When projects you don't like are going forward, you demand more process, 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 and you pound the table. I want more process. And when the process doesn't work out, then you sue and litigate. And that's what happens with residential developments in, in this part, in this ANC and in Ward 3. And it's what is seeing, seeming to happen right now. This is a huge priority for the community to build these schools. This is an incredible opportunity to build two schools at once. It fell into our laps. Uh, it, it, it wasn't expected. And the idea that we would signal to DCPS and the council who wasn't always enthusiastic about dealing with Ward 3 schools. They didn't always want, they didn't want to focus on this. The idea that we're going to uh, signal to them that there is, that the community is going to fight this is really problematic. And the notion that the community is only the people who live closest to a project is uh, another NIMBY idea that I find offensive and problematic. And I would remind JP, uh, in, in response to his, his soliloquy at the beginning, you took an oath, as did we all, to take uh, actions that are in the best interest of the District of Columbia. And more public schools for public school students is in the interest of, 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 of Ward 3 students and students who want a lottery into Ward 3 schools, which are the best in the city. And that's why people move here. And that's why people want to, who from other wards, want a lottery into these schools. This is, this is a, a critical issue. And so um, that's why I will not be seconding or voting in support of this resolution. And would the commissioner yield for a question? Yes, I will. Uh, well, Commissioner Bergman. Sure. Well, uh, so Commissioner Bergman, is it your understanding that uh, since you uh, uh, displayed those slides that when DCPS adds trailers to a school, that it increases the number of stated seats that that school provides for students? That's, that is an interesting question. Um, I would uh, ask former question. Commissioner Travis. <laughs> the, the answer yeah. is yes, but then. Yeah. Thank you. All right, any other commissioners? Would any other commissioners like to speak? All right. Um, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to raise my hand. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Kate, go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairperson. And uh, you know, I'm sorry the, that the conversation tonight has just devolved in the way it has. I've seen in the chat uh, just a number of insults flying left and right. I think those of us uh, do, who do have children uh, in trailers and those of us who don't, who just want uh, to see the overcrowding issue um, addressed and are learning the history of this issue, it does seem uh, that we're not interested in uh, calls for delays of process or calls for you know DCPS to reconsider its plans to expand and address the overcrowding issue. And I think plans to equate traffic issues with the education of our children, I think that requires some further examination on everyone's behalf. Um, we not only lost a year of education for our kids with the pandemic, 
Uh, but we face another situation where we have kids in trailers only two days a week and we have some catching up to do. And we really should think about how we are gonna contribute to the city more broadly and think a little bit bigger about what we want for our kids going forward in this neighborhood. And I hear a lot, you know, in terms of the, I see a lot in the chat, um, you know, on, you know, that, that nobody has heard about these plans. And I think that there's a, there's a time and place to call for a meeting and a briefing and, and more information. But I think an unending call for transparency um, and process and traffic studies, which I'm sure will all be in train, I think is gonna be seen as a delay tactic. And I think, I just think tactically it's going to, um, you know, cause for reconsideration as as others have already said. So I think we wanna be very careful and very strategic in how we preserve resources in, in this ward and to address a serious problem that's only gotten worse over the last year. And we've seen that schools adjust to pick up and drop offs very well. So, um, with that, I will turn it over to my fellow commissioners to uh, to offer their views. Thank you, Kate. Um, Commissioner Elkins. Well, I've, I've tried to listen closely to everything that's been said tonight. Um, I, I came in uncertain about where we ought to go on this, but I, I do think this is a dangerous letter to send at this time in the juncture of uh, the political situation in the city. I think that I certainly agree with members of the surrounding community that when we come to the point of actually building these schools that there needs to be close uh, coordination with people who live right near the schools in terms of drop off and all the other impacts. I, I, I certainly agree with that. Um, but I think this is the wrong time uh, for reasons that have already been stated to send a letter that looks like this ANC does not want uh, more schools in our in our area. I think that that will be taken, could be taken by people who were not in favor of this in the first place to say, well, that just, that's all we need. Uh, there are a lot of needs in other parts of the city, which I think we all know they are. Uh, and we're really lucky that the city has decided to even, even uh, consider giving us these schools, it's not locked in. It's not locked in at all. And it can disappear overnight. And I think that that would be a disaster uh, for this area. So I, I'm not against a letter at some point in terms of public engagement. I just think it would be misinterpreted at this point. It could be very dangerous and we could lose these schools, both of them. They haven't bought, as far as I know, they haven't bought GDS yet. That's a lot of money. So I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm, I, those of you who know me know that I am really into public engagement. I've been pressing the city on a number of fronts in the last six months on this issue of public engagement. But I think this case is the wrong time. Commissioner Thanks. Elkins, um, I think you said it well. Um, I, I also was on the fence on how, how to go with this. Um, this vote, but um, I agree with you completely. I, th I think what you said, I would echo everything you said there. Thank you, Jeremy. Jason, I saw your hand raised earlier. Yeah, um, sorry to come in a, uh, just a little bit late. This is um, uh, deeply personal, uh, not only as a commissioner who represents the people who surround this potential school, um, but also just a, a dad who has two kids that will probably go into whatever schools are built. Um, we, we live two blocks from this site. And um, I, I, I want to just sort of um, reinforce the the comments that Kate and I do this a lot Kate so thank you uh, I you know I reinforce the comments that Kate and also Michael made tonight um, I, I I think right now we we need to take a step back and and take us by all means um, and and I've also talked with, closely with the Fox Hall Community Association I think we need to take those um, considerations into mind and then 
think of a way that we can um, move forward and recognize that things are changing and how best to do it. I think, you know, Kate makes a really good point that, you know, things like a traffic survey and those sorts of things that might slow this down, but, you know, ultimately, you know, will work out. You know, these are things that ultimately will work out. Um, I, I, I think we should, we should do those things, but I, at this point, I also agree this is not the right time for this letter. So, I, and, and deep respect for JP and his, his amazing commitment to the community. I, I couldn't, I could not respect him more for, for his letter, but I don't think it's the right time. Any other comments from commissioners? I'm scrolling through screens, looking. Okay, do we have a second on JP's letter? Okay, there's no second, so there's no, no vote. Uh, moving on, uh, next thing on the list is a landlord tenant licensing requirements with uh, Commissioner Simkowitz. Um, in addition to being an ANC commissioner, I'm an attorney that practices in the District of Columbia Superior Court. And whenever I appear in landlord tenant uh, court, uh, the division of this uh, Superior Court, I've noticed significant inequities that face individuals uh, when they're about to be evicted from their homes. In hope that the District of Columbia can address these inequities, I prepared a resolution that provides safeguards for these individuals. Uh, the DC Council recently enacted uh, DC Act 24-3 entitled Fairness in Renting Con uh, Congressional Review Emergency Amendment Act of 2021. This is an emergency measure that unfortunately will expire on April 24th, uh, 2021. This act uh, requires housing providers uh, to do certain things before they can evict uh, people, and it, it provides uh, some protections for people facing evictions. And I was asked by um, uh, Commissioner Elkins uh, to prepare this resolution uh, because I have experience in this area in, in the District of Columbia Superior Court. And uh, I cannot tell you the number of times when I've been in court representing another client and not able to, um, to talk to uh, somebody that walks up to me in court, but I've had people literally crying and begging me to help them uh, because they're about ready to be evicted. And that, that has uh, been, uh, you know, it's, it's a very hard thing to tell somebody, I cannot help you, I can't ethically help you. But I've, I've had to do that and probably every lawyer that has ever practiced in the, in the landlord tenant division uh, has had to tell people that. Uh, my resolution um, uh, asks that the uh, emergency provisions of, of Act 24-3 be made permanent. And it also says, um, uh, has two provisions uh, that, that go beyond that. Number one, that all landlords in both residential and commercial leases, before they can get into court, they have to file what's called a clean hand certification attesting that uh, they have a valid uh, rental license and that their corporate status is in good standing and that um, any citation for uh, uh, improper uh, rental, such as a failure to have a fire uh, um, detector or anything like that are paid and the violations are corrected. And the failure to file such a clean hand certification will result in the clerk's office automatically rejecting the filing. Um, and the second thing, uh, is that the District of Columbia provide attorneys paid for by the District of Columbia to all tenants, and I have to emphasize, in residential, not commercial matters, in residential uh, matters only, uh, where a housing provider seeks a judgment uh, to evict uh, the tenant, uh, that the District of Columbia provide an attorney for that tenant so that somebody is advocating on their behalf and um, can look to see if there are any defenses that the uh, that the person facing eviction uh, may have, and you know that may be a um, a groundbreaking thing because, uh, frankly, it's never happened before. However, I, I I ask everybody to consider the cost to both the individual, the personal trauma to the individual being evicted, but also to society when when somebody's evicted, uh, they're put out on the street. The District of Columbia has to take 
a, a lot of um, interest in them uh, to avoid these people uh, being uh, you know, forced to live on the street. And they should do that. But all that has a cost. There might be a better way to spend that money. And that is uh, by hiring an attorney to, to make sure that everything uh, has been followed by the court system and the landlord prior to uh, doing um, the, the drastic step of eviction. So therefore, I move that my, resolu uh, my, uh, uh, my resolution be adopted and my resolution uh, be sent to the, um, to the appropriate officials as stated in the resolution. Thank you, JP. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Any discussion? Yeah, I, I just would like to briefly, I think everyone, I hope everyone supports this just to reiterate JP's uh, point. Um, and I'm glad that there was a resolution that I could enthusiastically cheer on JP uh, tonight. Uh, I think this is a great ambitious uh, idea that I, I'm also an attorney and I've, I've been in landlord tenant court and the asymmetry between a landlord who has almost always has counsel and a tenant who does not um, is it, it has real, real devastating effects in, in all kinds of ways. The procedural issues that JP mentioned at the beginning, the tenants don't even know about the procedures that they have already, which is why uh, uh, I, I hope we can, uh, we can have um, Nicole McEnty uh, say something briefly about that issue, because that is a huge problem that the existing rights because partly because tenants don't have counsel, they don't know that they have the right to have counterclaims around conditions or, or whatever. There are various issues and they end up um, potentially being evicted, which can have a devastating impact for a long, long time. So I think this is great. And, and I'm just gonna put in the chat um, some information from uh, Legal Aid in case you know anybody um, who, who needs um, eviction help. Um, there are another resource as well. And Commissioner Bergman um, and I have discussed this issue, uh, and and I'd like everybody to know that he has done uh, significant pro bono work, which means he works for free in this in this uh, realm. And um, unfortunately, uh, there are not enough Commissioner Bergmans in the city uh, to to help the people that are in need. And uh, like Commissioner Bergman said. Uh, there are a lot of people that go into this court and they, they just don't know their rights. They don't know mm -hmm. that they have a right to, um, uh, to challenge what's going on. And that's why it's so critical, uh, in addition to the, the pro bono lawyers that are out there, and there are, there are pro bono lawyers out there, there's just not enough of them. So uh, yep. there's a significant number of people that slip through the crack. And that's what my uh, resolution is, is gained, is, is um, oriented to doing. The resolution gives an attorney, gives a voice to these people uh, who frankly don't have a voice. Commissioner Simkowitz, um, uh, could you like just catch me up a little bit on this? Because my understanding is that DC tenant law is is very tenant favorable. Um, so I, I'm kind of confused as to to how there is such an issue and and as a landlord myself, I've, I've experienced um, some, you know, attempts at manipulation when I have, I have potential renters coming in um, to try and use the system to their advantage. Um, so I'm just curious. Well, uh, uh, Commissioner Del Morel, there, um, the, the resolution uh, a part that is, uh, has already been in, uh, um, enacted as an emergency measure by the council for what, just one aspect is, that people were being evicted uh, where there was no evidence that they were ever properly served with process. And unless you object to service of process uh, formally inside the court, that defense that you have is waived. So uh, the, this, uh, the emergency measure that the council passes, passed uh, required better evidence uh, as a condition to, to the case moving forward. That's just one example. Um, another thing is that uh, let's suppose somebody was uh, uh, behind on their rent for an amount that was below, uh, I believe, six hundred dollars. Uh, that could stay on their record, so that when they go to look for another house, uh, a future landlord could look at that as grounds to uh, prevent them from from um, 
being able to get another lease. Uh, moreover, um, sometimes a landlord tenant uh, defendant, meaning uh, a tenant, wins in the landlord tenant court, but under the current situation, uh, again, a, a potential landlord, a future landlord, could look at the fact that they were, quote, in the system and hold that against them. This resolution uh, prevents them from doing that. And I can't take credit for that. That's in, in the council's bill. But uh, it re again, it's, it's a temporary measure. We want to make it permanent. And, um, you know, you don't want somebody uh, who is, is uh, you know, gone through the system to be uh, 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 hampered, hampered in the, in the um, ability to get another, uh, another home if, if they ever choose to do so. And, and this uh, protects them from that. Great, thanks so much for that explanation. Um, anyone else with comments, questions? Uh, I believe Ms. McEntee uh, from the Office of Tenant Advocacy is here. And, and uh, I know from talking to her before, uh, she may have some comments. I think you're muted. Uh, if I can get you unmuted. There yep. you go. How's that? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and I just want to note my colleague, um, Cristobal, who also works with me in the office of tenant advocate is here as well. Um, so he might have a little to say as well. Um, if you could un unmute him after, but, um, yeah, I mean, thank you for this resolution. This, this bill is, is really important. There's a lot of provisions in here. Um, that you know we don't have currently, and um, and they were passed as a temporary measure, um, and you know we'd like to see them um, permanent. Um, kind of toward what you were speaking about earlier, Commissioner, um, it is really important that um, tenants are uh, represented in court, but not only that, that they that they know that they have a court date, um, and the way that um, prior to this emergency legislation, the way that landlord tenant court generally worked was that um, a tenant got a notice in the mail or on their door or served to them at their door that said, hey, you have a court date. Um, whereas in other states, I think in Virginia um, specifically, tenants are required to be notified by their landlord that their landlord is going to file for eviction on them. So, so this bill actually has a provision that requires the housing provider to um, inform the tenant of an intent to file a claim against them um, for rent possession. Um, so that's a big one. Um, similarly, the um, uh, landlords could file for possession for non-payment of rent for essentially any amount of rent. Um, and this, this bill has a provision that limits that to over $600. Um, the filing fee in court for a landlord currently, I think it's like 50 or 60 bucks. Um, so, there's, there's almost no um, limit on the landlord um, having the ability to, to you know, file in court. As long as they have 60 bucks and they can prove the, the tenant owes some rent, they can essentially file um, for eviction for the tenant um, on a rent basis. And that eviction um, prior to, to recent legislation would stay on their record. Um, not only that, but it's a, it's a huge onus on the tenant if they find out about the court date to actually show up to court and represent themselves or get a lawyer. Um, so, so there's a lot of good things in this legislation and you know, we, we hope that you support the resolution. Um, Cristobal, did you have any more to add? I think he's muted. If, if you don't mind unmuting Cristobal. I think you're unmuted, but I'm not sure what's going on here. We still can't hear you. Maybe a mic issue, right? Uh, there, oh, no, that was Ben. No. Uh, here, why don't I try, I muted you and now I'm going to ask to unmute. We will read lips. <laughs> we won't, sorry, I'm bad at that. Um, hmm. Guess I have a question. Okay. What is the um, eviction timeline? So there were no evictions happening during, um, during COVID, correct? But if these measures were to um, take full effect, what is the additional timeline that you would see that from start to finish to completed eviction uh, prior to adding these rules? And if these rules are added, what would that look like? Sure, so the current, um, uh, under, under the public health emergency, which was just extended today, 
to May 20th, um, we no landlords can can um, uh, execute an eviction or serve a tenant notice of eviction, um, which is required um, for for 30 Hello. days after the public health emergency. Um, so since that it was extended to May 20th. Um, the earliest you could actually like file in court for eviction would be 30 days after that. Um, and then the court process can take anywhere from, uh, you know, I mean, supposedly a month, but I've never seen it that quick, you know, to, right, to you know, three can months. Can you hear me now? Yes, we yes, can hear yes. you. Ah, yes. Fantastic. I, I'm sorry. I was trying to mess around with this. I apologize. Uh, I had one foot off the merry-go-round there. Um, so thank you for having us here. And just to oh. put this into context, right? The the main idea here is that, you know, in the district, you know, in past years, there was X amount of, uh, of evictions, right? Uh, the, the reality of the situation is that due to the pandemic, this is gonna be exponentially more. And whenever the protections that uh, my colleague Nicole is speaking about are gonna expire, uh, there's potentially gonna be a significant uh, exponentially more evictions. And that as other commissioners have pointed out is gonna have other uh, consequences and other burdens further down the further down the road. So what we're trying to do at the Office of the Tenant Advocate is simply uh, to get the word out that you know the the capabilities of our office and trying to you know uh, talk to as many ANC commissions and anybody uh, to um, really to 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 paint the picture of what's gonna what's gonna happen once the public health emergency expires. So uh, in response to Mr. Del Moral's question, um, you know, the, the, there has been prohibitions on eviction filings. Uh, however, that prohibition, it was actually, uh, well, there's a court case going on right now in Judge Epstein's uh, chambers and DC Superior Court. However, um, what's gonna happen once the public health emergency expires, we're not entirely sure. We know that the US Marshal Service will start executing evictions. 21 days after the public health emergency expires. But other than that, we're not entirely sure. And as to your question of how long a case is gonna last, well, you know, uh, th there's just nobody that can tell you that. There's a backlog of tens of thousands of cases right now in, in DC Superior Court. So, you know, it, it depends on when your case was filed. Uh, and uh, yeah, basically- Yeah, I guess my period. question is more, uh, I apologize. I, I think my question is more, let's assume the backlog gets resolved um, and let's, let's assume we're looking at, you know, apples to apples. So the current, you know, whatever the process pre COVID was, whatever. So you file your claim, uh, you ask for your court date, you have your court date and you start the eviction process. And this is, this is pre all these new potential uh, additions to the regulation. And now we're looking at 2023, all the backlog is, is, is complete. Any, any, um, any um, eviction backlog has, is done. So now you file a claim uh, for an eviction um, with these new provisions, which one of them is, I, I think there is like, and I just briefly read it, that they would come into the house to verify even that the smoke detectors are working. So that's just one item. So you'd have to check, you'd have to check the home to make sure it's in good working order um, for that eviction. But overall, I mean, this is obviously just a, a um the, you probably can't have a perfect answer for this but what would you guys expect the 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 increased time to go from filing to completing an eviction under this new under the new uh guys new regulations versus the old regulations that current that that exist so the current regulations uh you know landlords still need to have a basic business license a certificate of occupancy uh, fire detectors, carbon monoxide detectors. So all of that is already in place, right? I believe that what uh, the commissioner, commissioner, uh, well, JP, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, what, what he was proposing was a, a certificate of clean hands, right? So that certificate, uh, I, I'm, I mean, I'm not sure what it would entail, but that would be something just like the BBL or the certificate of occupancy that all landlords in the District of Columbia right now are required to have by law. So that's not a new thing. And uh, the next thing is, uh, in terms of, you know, once the backlog's up, I can't really answer that question either because I don't know who the defendant is, right? So if the defendant is unrepresented, uh, well, that case is probably going to move forward pretty quickly and they're going to be evicted pretty quickly. Uh, if, the, if the defendant was living in a place with a substandard uh, have, or that didn't, didn't reach the habit of, uh, warranty of habitability, 
Well, then that's probably going to take longer, right? Because the judge is going to take into account all the violations that haven't been abated by that landlord. So in, in reality, I can't tell you how long a case is going to take, you know, uh, justice, the justice system in general, not just the landlord tenant court is a case specific always. So uh, I, I, I can't, I can't really give you an answer to that one. But, uh, but again, those obligations are already in the law, right? So that, that's already part of the law for all DC landlords. Uh, this is Chuck. Jeremy, I think I, another answer for your question, if you look at the, the letter here, uh, the, um, we are, it, it, this, this, the, the bill calls for a 30 day notice to the tenant as opposed to what, seven days or something like that. Um, uh, the landlord is already supposed to have clean hands. They're supposed to comply with DC law. So um, I don't think it's fair to consider that as a delay. That's just that they should have shaped up to begin with. So I think we're talking about a fairly small increment of time just to make sure that the tenant has adequate notice uh, that in fact, that they are subject to eviction. Well, I would just say, Chuck, you would hope that that would be the case, but I think some of the clean hands provisions that JP is talking about in this resolution, you'd be shocked how landlords, particularly like landlords of low income tenants, they, they don't have clean hands. Um, well, I know that. I, yeah. I've worked in this area considerably in the last two years, and I certainly agree with you, but that's, that uh, is, well, I think Jeremy is worried about landlords being unfairly prejudiced here. Yeah, I mean, I think I think if we're talking about clean hands and that that doesn't seem to be an issue for me. It's more of yes, this this sense of um, extension um, because I mean, I will tell you from you know you guys as a few of you know, I'm pretty new to this, and there are people that prey on you know the the single like landlord the individual landlord who is going in who may not know all the right may not know all the rules may not know how to do a sufficient background check and and they are trying to get into spaces um in order to just um uh just stay there until this this new person can get their their arms around it um and you know luckily enough for me i i have a pretty decent background that that i didn't get caught up in that but i did have multiple multiple people um, come look at the property and they were, they were just trying to get in and, and have me hand over keys in order to sit there without paying rent. So that's, that's where I am. Uh, that's what concerns me about, about making changes to an already existing uh, challenging space. Madam Chair. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking through this complex uh, issue, and uh, I think we're ready now after discussion to vote. Um, I'd like to make a friendly amendment. This sorry. is uh, Commissioner Elkins. Yep. I've put it into the chat. I think this is a friendly amendment. Got to scroll it, way it, up. <laughs> it, it re, yeah, it, it, it's, it's pretty close to the bottom. I'm having trouble bringing it up because it, it doesn't. Commissioner uh, Elkins, can you just read it? Because I can't find yes, it. Yes, I would like to read. I'm trying to. Okay, here it is. I'm recommending that at the end of the first paragraph, we add a sentence that summarizes what this letter is telling the reader. And it would read something like, in particular, ANCD, ANC3D recommends that the Fairness and Renting Congressional Review Emergency Emergency Amendment Act of 2021 be made permanent and consider in addition requiring a clean hand certification and providing attorneys paid for by the District of Columbia to tenants in danger of losing their housing. It's simply trying, before they have to read the whole letter, they know what we're telling them. Uh, that's perfect. And Commissioner Elkins, I thank you for asking me to, uh, to uh, prepare this resolution because I think it's necessary and I would never have thought of this on my own. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for doing it. I think and, it's and thank very you to, uh, to the. Uh, to uh, uh, Ms. McEntee and uh, Mr. Puig for coming in from the Office of Tenant Advocacy. Uh, but I think, uh, Commissioner Elo, we are ready to take the vote. And Riley, uh, uh, do you have the Microsoft Word version to insert that? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you. OK, thanks so much. Any other discussion or uh, amendments? With that, 
Riley, take it away. Uh, 3D01? Yes. 3D02? Yes. 3D03? Yes. 3D04? Aye. 3D05? Yes. 3D06? Yes. 3D07? Yes. 3D08? Yes. 3D09? Yes. And 3D10? Yes. All right, thanks so much. Um, and thank you for staying. It is now 1016 and uh, I really appreciate the time that you guys took to be here. Thank, thank you. you. Absolutely, thank you, commissioners. Have a great evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks for the work you do. Um, all right, we are moving on to something in uh, my SMD. This is 4900 Rodman Street and I am going to attempt to share my screen. Uh, I have three screens uh, as I work in finance. Um, so hopefully I'm sharing the right screen. I hope what you guys can see is a map of the property that um, we're looking at. So what is being requested, and I believe um, the, the architect is online right now. So Gabby, if you would like to walk through this, um, we can. Um, what I'd like to do is just uh, walk through this quickly and uh, open it up to see if we have a second to it and if there's any discussion and then Gabby, uh, that's when uh, you, if we need to um, ask questions, uh, I can get your input there. So what's being proposed here is uh, an addition off to the right. Uh, as you can see the property, um, the backyard is actually here. And so if you look at a Google map here, um, what I am showing you is the property right here. And so you can see is with the other two properties that are in line on Rodman, their uh, building structures go straight to the line. And so what's being proposed here is an addition that goes straight to the line versus anything going back or on the side here or in there, what's, what's really their front yard. So we're, we're talking about um, in addition, the front door to the house is right here. And um, and what we've received is support from the surrounding neighbors here uh, for this zoning exception. And um, with that, I'd like to see if there is a second to this um, proposal, which is to um, support the the architect's recommendations for the addition here. Commissioner, uh, just verifying that we have written approval from 4920 Rodman on the plan. They would be the most impacted. Yep. Gabby, um, I think you're on the line here. Um, let me see if I can open it up to Gabby. I... Actually, uh, Ella, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Um, Greg Wiedemann is on the line too. Um, He's the architect as well, so I'm, I'm going to hand it over to him. I don't know where he is or how to open him up. Really just a, a yes, no on approval from 4920 Rodman. Yeah. yeah I, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there a second to supporting this? Second. Thank you. What, what, is the relief, what is the relief being sought? Uh, it's it's uh, to have the addition uh, go past where the zoning is on the line. So very similar to what um, you have on 4920 and 4930. Sorry, it's setback relief? Setback relief. It is. It would be 15.9 feet that we're requesting. Um, we would not be going up to the property line. They would be 8.9 feet from the property line that abuts 4920 Rodman Street. Madam Chairman, I have a friendly amendment. Okay. This is uh, Mr. Elkins. Um, if this were Wesley Heights, I would strongly oppose this because we have a um, um, Wesley Heights overlay, and this type of approach is a way of getting around the overlay. 
uh, this this neighborhood that you're proposing this for does not have an overlay. So I have asked for a friendly amendment that um, this does not set a precedent for uh, this kind of um, approval of this kind of special exception um, in uh, in those cases where there's a a uh, an overlay that that it it's not a precedent. It could still be approved in Wesley Heights, but and other places that were overlay. But it's this is not seen as a precedent. It's friendly, yes. I think it's truly situational. Um, yes. Yes. So the property forty nine hundred shares a driveway with thirty seven sixteen, and so. What is the, I guess, rear of the house is actually the side yard. So they can't build um, anything on the back of the house because they have that shared driveway. So that's why we're requesting to be able to build on the side of the house, which is actually the rear yard, the property. Thanks, Gabby. It's hard to see with the yeah. satellite view here, but yes. Um, all right. Are, are any more discussion items on this? Mr. Kravitz? Uh, yeah, Paige, uh, uh, Commissioner Ela, Chairperson Ela. Um, I, I'm not sure if I, I, did I, did you mention something about the neighbor? Did I? Yes. Yeah, there's been support from the surrounding neighbors. I, I mean, I'm, as many of you know, uh, pretty intimately familiar with this property. It's it's less than a block from my house. Um, I know exactly what they're talking about looking at the design. It, it, it's, it's relatively unobtrusive, all things considered. Um, it's a corner lot. So given the orientation of, of the property, it basically takes up, um, you know, what you would think of as a side yard, but is in fact a rear yard in this case. Um, and the, the setbacks are a little screwier as a result of it being a corner lot. But um, this seems like the kind of thing that is appropriate for our neighborhood if we want to try and prevent homes from being torn down. And that's all the rage in Spring Valley as you knock down the homes, including the one across the street from my house. I'm living in a teardown now, it seems like. Um, and uh, one thing that the Spring Valley neighbors have talked a lot about is, is, a, is a distaste for the teardowns that are happening. And the way to present, prevent that is to um, allow and encourage your neighbors to put you know, um, subtle, um, conform, relatively compatible additions to their homes to price them out of teardown material. So it doesn't just become a Bethesda South. So I, I mean, I, I, I think this is a, an appropriate use of uh, the, the exception request. Thank you, Troy. And if I could just say one thing, the proposed addition is just one mm -hmm. and a half stories. So it's, it doesn't even uh, go up to the existing ridge of the house. It kind of mirrors the other side of the existing house that has a small porch. So we're keeping it in character and in scale with um, the existing porch on the opposite end of the house. Madam Chair, I believe we're ready for the question. Okay, great. Uh, we are ready to vote. So Riley, would you like to do a roll call again? Uh, yes. You wanna stop sharing your screen? Yes. Stop, there we go. Uh, 3DO1? Yes. 3DO2? Yes. 3DO3? Yes. 3DO4? Aye. 3DO5? I'm going to go with I this time. Yeah. 3DO6? Aye. 3DO7? Sorry. Yeah. Yes. 3DO8? Yes. 3DO9? Yes. 3D10? No problem. Yes. Right. Approved unanimously. Thank you very much. And Gabby, thank, thank you for being on so long. No problem. Thank you very much. Long live anachronism. All right, here we go. Uh, resolution regarding, so now we're on the resolution regarding uh, Metro bus and uh, we are on to Commissioner Bergman. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Commissioner Damian and I, um, drafted this resolution. Um, Christian, we didn't talk about how to discuss this. So I don't know if you wanna, maybe we, Riley, if you could just pull up the maps and maybe we'll take turns just discussing the, the cuts because I think neighbors should 
um, know about them and one goal of this resolution, well, our participant count is probably going down, but one, one goal of this resolution is to inform uh, neighbors so that they can also participate in um, the, the comment process. You can, you can uh, communicate with WMATA. I will say one thing upfront that the reality is that this is a little bit of a messaging exercise by WMATA. They put out these like terrible cuts that's basically hurting everyone throughout the region in some way um, because they want to put pressure on the federal delegation to deliver more funding, which hopefully they will, but it is still severe. And I think it's important for us to address that. So I, if, if you could go to the, the, um, the, uh, the, I guess the D, um, the D6 one, which is, I sent the page numbers to you. It's, um, and Christian, do you want to talk about the D6? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, let me just, one second. Uh, so the problem with the D6 route is that um, if it's eliminated like they proposed, it's going to um, really disadvantage people who live in the uh, Fox Hall Village area, especially those who are trying to get to um, the MedStar Georgetown University Hospital because right now the, uh, the bus does have a stop, but with the alternate route proposed, they would have to walk a few blocks, which is very difficult, especially for public health people who would be commuting at night. Next slide. Other yeah. reasons. Um, and so one of the main issues with eliminating the D6 route is just that people who live in Palisades and Fox Hall Village are gonna have difficulties is a real threat of actual cuts to ANC 3D um, routes that could really harm some of our residents who rely on public transit. Yeah, absolutely. It, um, the page 107, Riley, is the M4, which is the Nebraska Avenue line that will be cut entirely under the plan. Um, so essentially folks who live uh, in uh, the Palisades and Foxall will be dependent upon the N6. Um, and What's devastating about this, um, well, actually, let's maybe we'll just skip ahead to the next one to the, and then we'll talk about it all together. The uh, page 115 is the N, uh, N2, N4, N6 route as well. And you see here, they're going to, they, they, they would eliminate the N2 and N4, just have the N6. Um, and if you think about these things collectively, um, before the pandemic, 10,000 people took these, but these routes. Um, during on weekdays, at least, right before the pandemic. Uh, and according to the WMATA study, 65% of people who ride the M4 will not be able to use the same bus stop uh, to, 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 to begin a WMATA ride. So they'll have to go, they'll have to walk some greater distance. That number is 44% for D6 riders and 39% for people who ride the Massachusetts Avenue line, the N2, N4, N6. So that, that means incredible traffic um, because people in this area of town, especially as you get further away from where I live and where Christian lives, where we're, you can walk to, you can walk to Tenley Town. Uh, people, Christian's constituents who are maybe a little bit sprier, they'll, they'll get there. But as you get toward, towards the Palisades, the, the Metro is far away. This is the only public transit option that we have uh, in 3D. Um, so it would be devastating for, for many people and lead to traffic. So, and, I, and, and I would, there are two letters. One is a letter to Amada that would authorize either Christian or myself to testify uh, in front of Amada. And then the other is a letter to the Virginia and Maryland federal delegation, the Congress people who have seats right on the other side in Virginia, several of them. The, the folks in Maryland and the senators, uh, because the reality is that if, if 10,000 people in this part of town are driving to work or taking Ubers, they're gonna, their constituents are gonna have uh, more intense traffic. So it's, an, it's, 
we, we, we benefit this time from all the throughway traffic from Virginia, Maryland and defending our bus routes. So. Madam you Chairman. And what do you wanna call your proposal into question and ask for a second? Sure, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll, I will, I'll call it and maybe Commissioner Damiano can second it and then we'll just. Uh, yeah, sure, second. <laughs> Okay, Madam do you want Chairman. to say, yeah, yes, Commissioner. Oh, may I ask the, the sponsors to, um, the out of out of respect, because I always do make a point of this when there's something going around in Congress from, from us, that, that we include Delegate Norton on the letter. He's copied. Um, I mean, <laughs> the argument would be, I hear you. The argument is that this letter is less about um, I guess we could have had a third letter to her um, making the point. This this letter was like, you guys should care about us and you have senators. I, I hear you, I hear you. We could, we, could we at least uh, put the, the appropriate phrasing in an email uh, that we send the copy to her? I think we can, we'll work with you on that language. I'll accept that as a friendly amendment. <laughs> what, what about the possibility of, sent, of copying her um, on the first letter, the one that's going to WMATA. I think she is copied on that letter. She's copied on both. She's copied on that. Oh, she, yeah, she's copied on both. All right, so French language and email specifically to um, Ellen. Sure. Yeah. Holmes. Yes. Okay. All right, uh, so we've got a second. We've had discussion. We're ready to vote. Riley, hit it. 301. Okay, it's I. 302. Aye. 303. Aye. 304. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Aye. 306. I slash yes. 307. I. 3D08. I, my gosh. 3D09. Yes. 3D10. All right. Okay, unanimous. Moving on, uh, again, back to Commissioner Bergman on outdoor learning funding resolutions. And if, if you'll permit me to say just a few th quick things. Please. Um, Riley, do you mind pulling pictures from today? Uh, so Mann Elementary School is so lucky to have the leadership of uh, Principal Liz Wisnett and uh, who's been planning now for uh, almost a full year for outdoor learning opportunities. And today what you can see is incredible joyful learning that occurred on the campus of uh, our local elementary school. And it, it almost makes me cry to see this happening. Um, it does. So um, just thank you to all of the teachers at Mann Elementary School for what they're doing. It's, it's incredible. So Ben, over to you. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. Sorry. I, no, <laughs> it makes no. me so happy. No, I totally, <laughs> I totally, totally get it. Um, you know, I, 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 my, my son, he uh, is a pre-K uh, four student man this year, and they started an outdoor learning um, uh, experiences in the fall on certain Wednesdays. And it was just an hour uh, a week. Um, they would do some garden stuff. Uh, they would just, I don't even know what they, he would never tell me what they did, but it, you can tell the, the impact that it has on them and, and even the impact it has on their um, ability to do virtual learning together um, is improved. And, um, and I, in this, um, this resolution, it does two things. It, it, it just encourages, it sort of expresses our support for um, the mayor, the recent announcement by DCPS, like very recent, that they were gonna invest $9 million to support creative learning models, including outdoor learning. Um, it's unclear how that breaks down. And also um, echoing the, the letter from the SBOE that um, called for a specific amount of, of $4 million 
And there are, are a number of things that, um, that the reason for that money, it's not as simple as just going outside. There is, that is, you know, that is also something that happens and that is man incorporated the sort of outdoor learning stuff they already have in the fall. But there are, there are other considerations um, for how to make kind of weatherized facilities. Um, and I'm just gonna pull up um, some of the examples. So, so some of the examples from um, Principal Wisna was amplification devices. So having a teacher speak outdoors is a, can be a drain on voices. Um, figuring out um, how to clean materials, how to have multiple sets, sharing the outdoor space. I know from talking to my son's teacher that that's a concern, their, their space is limited. So that, that requires some thought. And then all, and just a sort of obvious one, when it's bad weather, um, does that mean that school is canceled? Um, and if you have an outdoor learning, and it doesn't have to be if you have the facilities. And one thing that we, I put it in this resolution, I think is really important. Outdoor learning is beneficial after the pandemic. And so the investments in, in equipping schools in DC with, with being able to engage in outdoor learning, I think it will, will be useful uh, going forward. And there's some you know, speculation that we're gonna continue to have some virtual learning um, and limited in-person instruction in the fall. So even though the vaccinations are happening, it's still a useful thing to, to, to focus on. So that's, that's the resolution. And we would, the, the, I wish to note, it does authorize um, either uh, Chairperson Ela, or Commissioner Rao or myself to testify. I would hope it would be uh, our public health expert um, who I know has already been speaking about these issues who would who represent A and C3D on this. Cause I know the council's gonna, this is a you know proposal uh, as they think about the budget, it should come up. So hopefully we can we can weigh in when that when that comes up. Is there a second? Anybody? There's a second from me, obviously. Or is any other comments? I'm not the chair. Um, I should stop. No, I'm I gonna go on mute. We've done a second. Um, we we have a period of comments from commissioners and others. I, I would just quickly comment only because I've been deeply involved in this issue and uh, our last meeting I, you know for the sake of time didn't comment, but I did um, testify to the DC Board of Education last month. And it was, to be frank, um, received well that that we create an, you know, an outdoor learning environment for the for the students. And, um, and as a public health official or a public health I hate to call myself an expert, but a, a pu public health professional, I would say that um, you know it makes good sense that we mitigate the risk of COVID until we're all vaccinated, until the kids are all vaccinated, that we separate them uh, outside. So I, I think this is a great resolution and I support it strongly. That's all for me. I'd, I'd also just like to note that um, outdoor learning and the use of additional outdoor space is um, really pertinent in discussions of overcrowding that continue to persist and will continue to persist on our War three campuses. So um, better equipment, stronger tenting, et cetera, is uh, well-spent money. And I'm sorry I cried. I'm really excited about this. So. <laughs> All right. Ready? Uh, I think we're ready for a vote. Riley, it's you. 3D01. Aye. 3D02. Enthusiastic aye. 3D03. Aye. 3D04. Aye. 3D05. Aye. 3D06. Enthusiastic. Ah, uh, yes. 3D07. Aye. 3D08. Aye. 3D09. Yes. 3D10. Aye. All right. Thanks so much, Ben. And thanks, Jason, for your work on this, too. All right. We are moving on, finally, 
uh, 1040 and we were supposed to be done at 10 o'clock. I am sorry, uh, we are now moving on to uh, a final resolution that was brilliantly written by Christian. So uh, Christian, uh, oh. anyway. Thank you. Um, this letter came about after consultation with the DC Board of Elections and some of the other student commissioners that are across the district. Um, there are five or six of them and we try to keep in close contact about some of these issues. Uh, right now there are seven ANC single member district vacancies across the city, but two of them importantly are in districts with unique constituencies. These are uh, George Washington's main campus with students and um, the DC jail where residents are currently denied a voice on their ANC. So this resolution attempts to reduce these vacancies by recommending that the DC council take action to uh, make changes to the law that would ensure continued representation for these seats because in the past, historically, they have um, had vacancies for a variety of reasons, but uh, there are ways we can fix that. And um, that's been an issue all across the city, but also in my uh, 3D07 seat where uh, it was vacant for some time before I took office and quite a long time before Taylor Berlin, my predecessor, took office in 2018. So um, that's something that's very important to me. Uh, the letter specifically requested the council do four things. Um, the first is to allow vacancies to be filled during a public health crisis. Um, the law that they passed uh, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic uh, banned these um, vacancies from being filled during um, uh, those uh, the public health crises. crises. And so um, uh, we're just asking them to repeal that. The good thing is that the council is actually taking action on that now. Um, Robert White and Charles Allen introduced a bill and um, it's coming up for a vote either today or tomorrow in the very near future. So I hope that they will approve it and then send that to the mayor to be signed. Uh, the second thing is to allow electronic signatures on uh, nominating petitions permanently. Um, I think that system worked relatively well in the 2020 election, but it could be streamlined. Um, the issue was that when we were getting signatures, you had to email them the petition, have them print it off, sign it, scan it, and email it back to you. And that's convoluted. And um, a lot of people who either don't have access to a printer or don't have the requisite tech, um, technology knowledge we're not really able to participate in that process. So I, we're just asking them to streamline that process and make sure that um, it's easier for all people to use in the future. Uh, the third thing is to make petitions available upon request early. Um, a main issue for students who seek to fill ANC seats is that petitions usually become available around June 26th. And at that time, there are usually no students on campus to sign those petitions. So it's virtually impossible to get the amount of signatures you need. Um, I was able to do it this year because it was virtual so I could reach out to some you know, students, but uh, the vast majority of student commissioners typically run as write-in candidates, which um, makes it harder for them to actually win and it makes their campaigns more expensive. So uh, allowing them to, upon request with a valid reason, get access to the petition a little bit earlier would be very, very helpful in making sure that students can uh, you know, hold ANC seats. Finally, the fourth thing that the letter requests of the council is that um, it exercises its authority to reject proposed single member district boundaries that uh, deprive students or other minority populations of their um, voting privileges. So current DC law requires that um, uh, the single member district boundaries can't deprive or dilute um, this voting power. And so right now what we've seen is a lot of uh, districts that have primarily students or other unique constituencies uh, are have diluted representation. Um, my district specifically was an issue 10 years ago during the redistricting process and it's heavily gerrymandered to the point where I probably represent at least a thousand more people than I'm supposed to. And so um, it's just very important that the council um, when it's overseeing the redistricting process next year take action to make sure that uh, they're fairly distributed and that uh, all students, especially AU students get the representation they deserve uh, which is most likely remains to be seen more than one single member district that represents AU. So um, I move that the commission accept this letter and send the resolution to the DC council. Second. All right, uh, 3D01. Aye. 3D02. Aye. 3D03. Aye. 3D04. Aye. 3D05. Aye. 3D06. Aye. 3D07. Aye. 3D08. Aye. 3D09. Yes. 3D10. Aye.
All right, that, thank you very much, Christian. Um, that ends our official actions and we are on to commission business. Uh, first thing on our list is the approval of uh, February's minutes, which um, Riley circulated earlier this week. Uh, I, I move that we accept the minutes as um, ran unless anyone has any amendments to offer. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion, edits? All right, I think this is one that we can, uh, Commissioner Sariki, our parliamentarian, can we vote on this with uh, exceptions voting? That, that like, does anyone object? Oh that yeah, yeah. so, uh, okay. I ask unanimous consent to approve the motion. I, I ask say, is there objection? To approve the motion, is there an objection? No. Means All right. Thank you very much for that. All right. Treasurer's report. Yes. Um, we have an opening. We had a balance at the beginning of the month of $58,960.35. Our ending balance is $58,924.35. We only spent $36 um, because we are still in the process of getting things online um, to write more checks, uh, $33 for a stop payment charge for a, a check and $3 to the bank for paper statements for added security. That's the report. All right, and then um, any updates, Christian, on uh, communication matters from last month? I think we had some, some questions and wanted to see if you've got an update. Sure. So um, admittedly, I've been a little bit slow on implementing some of these changes, but uh, we're in the process of, you know, getting that done. So with social media, um, Riley did put together a Facebook page for us. Um, I haven't been able to really advertise that much yet or post it, but I plan to that next few days. Um, but that's going to be a you know, good place for us to post about the meetings and stuff. We did post the agenda, but, you know, it did not obviously get much um, attention because I haven't even shared it with you guys yet. Um, the website I have started looking at, I made a few minor changes on it a copy of the website um, you know, to the theme and colors and that kind of thing. But uh, that's gonna be a longer process. I hope to get finished before the summer, but it, it, you know, that's a lot of work. So I'm, I'm working on that and moving through it. Um, the one thing I did come across is that uh, the ANC does not have a logo or any real formal branding. So um, I was thinking that it might be a good idea to engage an AU student um, to look into that matter. I mean, there are a lot of students that do logos and stuff as part of their studies. And so I wasn't sure if that's something they would be interested in doing, but I figured I'll reach out and see. I know that they've done it for some clubs on campus. So I'll, I'll see if anyone would be interested in doing that. Um, and then finally, Riley has applied, I believe, for a next door account, but I, I don't think that application has been accepted yet. So uh, we'll see how that goes. But. That'd be terrific to have a next door account. I'm curious um, what people think about Facebook. I thought it was uh, maybe going in the direction of dinosaurs. <laughs> I'm wrong on that. I think the kids today use um, Instagram or TikTok or something, but I don't know. It feels like if we have the the Facebook, it's it's going to uh, direct quite. The people will know where, where to direct their uh, request want, for us to resign. I want Commissioner Elkins to do some transportation related TikToks. I think we need to make this happen. <laughs> I think we need a TikTok challenge and I'm looking for some, <laughs> uh, some suggestions for that. I'm, I myself, of course, am very active on TikTok. I don't know about the rest of you. <laughs> Madam Chairman, I have another item before we go. Yes. Um, just to get a sense of the commissioners. Um, uh, whether uh, we would like to invite Mary Che to come and uh, speak at one of our meetings. Um, it may not be possible because at least in the past, she used to teach on Wednesday evenings and just could not come. But I thought it might be worth, uh, if nothing else, make the, uh, make the offer because uh, I don't feel as if we have a very good, um, robust relationship with her. And I think uh, she has a lot to say and then our constituents like to hear. And, and I think we should uh, show affirmatively that we'd like her to have communication with us. 
So, but I, does anyone have any objection to that? Otherwise, if, if not, I will extend the invitation and see whether, um, Thank you. whether it fits in her calendar. Hopefully now with I everything. apologize, Chuck. Who are we talking about? Oh, uh, Mary Che. Uh, yeah, I think she would look forward to uh, to coming. She has come once, but that was because she had a vacation. Yeah. On teaching, so there may be a, an impediment, but we'll try. Hopefully, Zoom makes everything possible. So yeah, I was just gonna say that you can go from teaching to yeah. this pretty quickly. She was running a hearing the other day and she said, I've been gone for 10 minutes and she went and testified in another hearing and came back and started running her hearing again. So yes, it is possible. C Commissioner Elkins, if, if I could uh, chime in, I spent an inordinate amount uh, bidding and winning on a lunch with Mary Shea at uh, the Key School fundraising auction last year. And then the pandemic hit. So, Commissioner <laughs> Shea owes what, me. When she fixed the voting machines for you or something? What, what? <laughs> yeah, a very expensive lunch. So, if you'd like <laughs> me to play that card, I'm happy to play the card um, because technically I've I've purchased it. Yes, but, she owes you one. Despite right. despite the conflict of interest, I'll I'll put that out there. <laughs> awesome. All right, well, I, um, I think we're ready to wrap up this meeting. And before we wrap up the meeting, I wanna thank all of the commissioners for their work over the last month um, and for the dialogue and the collaboration and the discord and everything that comes with it. It's important to have open discussions and and I appreciate everyone's time and thought to this. Thank you. And that of the community. So thanks everyone. And uh, with that, I'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Do we have a second? Second. second. Okay. Uh, I will make, uh, do I have unanimous consent to adjourn the meeting. Any dissenters? <laughs> I screwed that up. Sorry. Just, just adjourn the meeting. <laughs> We're tired. Right. The meeting is over. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.